Welcome to a Top 5's compilation. Now, before we begin, odds are, if you love the content produced here, you've gone on your own researching endeavours to discover more mysteries of our world and universe. And when you're not studying the latest supernatural theories, you're probably re-watching your favourite cold case true crime series, spending a good portion of your time online. Which means you've probably wondered how safe your internet investigations are, or questioned how to watch new TV shows from other countries that would otherwise be unavailable. With Surfshark VPN, proud sponsors of this compilation, all of these internet-related issues are addressed, providing you with expert solutions. Surfshark VPN delivers you an opportunity to connect with servers from anywhere in the world at any given time. No matter what country you're in, you'll be able to access the internet as if you're traveling or moving across oceans. This means never before seen content that's only available in places hundreds of miles away is now accessible on updated libraries from your services like Netflix or Prime. All you have to do is switch servers on your VPN to a country of your choosing and brand new streaming libraries will be at your fingertips. There is no limit on devices either, truly pushing Surfshark above and beyond other VPNs. There's also additional security benefits as well. Surfshark VPN uses state-of-the-art encryption to keep all of your data secure and doesn't sell your browser history to third parties. Surfshark also blocks over a million known phishing websites automatically, giving you unmatched peace of mind. For a limited time, use our code TOP5s upon checkout to unlock an industry best 83% discount, along with three months free and a 30 day money back guarantee. Easily the fairest price on the VPN market. The time is now, so sit back, hit those lights, and make discovering the world's mysteries simpler with Surfshark VPN. Now, enjoy. The Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum The museum in Boston was the brainchild of Isabella Stewart Gardner, and after its completion, as well as being an art museum, Isabella also lived there. The museum is full of Isabella's private collection of priceless paintings, sculptures, tapestries, furniture, manuscripts, rare books, and decorative arts. When Isabella died in 1924, her will created an endowment of $1 million and outlined stipulations for the support of the museum, including that her collection be permanently exhibited forever for the education and enjoyment of the public, and that it be kept according to her aesthetic vision and intent. But however generous this was, in many ways, it would later become the museum's downfall. In 1988, an independent security consultant reviewed the museum's operations and security and made several recommendations for improvements to the building and its security. However, the improvements would mean significant renovations to the building, not in line with Isabella's vision. So that coupled with a lack of funds, the board rejected the recommendations. The security flaws of the museum were an open secret among the security staff and employees. The rejection of the improvements ultimately cost the museum $600 million and counting and it all began in the early hours of Sunday, March 18th, 1990, when two men disguised as police officers drove up to the side entrance of Isabella Stewart Museum, parked their car and walked to the side door. They rang the buzzer that went through to security guard Rick Abba. They explained through the intercom that they were police officers and had come to investigate the disturbance. Rick accepted their explanation and let the men in at 1.24 a.m. Once inside, the disguised men asked Abba if there was anyone else in the building, and if there was, could they call them to the security desk? The only other guard on duty that night was Randy Heston, who was working his first night shift. They then asked Abba to come from behind his desk so they could look at his ID. As he stepped away from his desk, he also stepped away from the panic button and any chance of alerting the real police. Abba was quickly pushed against the wall and handcuffed, then, as Hesland entered the room, he was also handcuffed. With both men restrained, the two officers revealed their true intention and asked the guards not to give them any problems. The thieves wrapped duct tape around the heads and eyes of the guards, and without asking for directions, they led the guards into the basement where they were handcuffed to a steam pipe and workbench. 
The thieves then examined the wallets of the guards and told them that they knew where they lived. And if they didn't tell authorities anything, they would be rewarded in a year's time. The thieves then made their way through the museum. Their movements were recorded on infrared motion detectors. As the thieves approached the paintings in the Dutch room, a device began beeping that would typically trip when a visitor was too close to a painting. The thieves smashed it, and then they went through the museum, removing canvases from their frames with a knife. As they prepared to leave, they checked on the guards and asked if they were comfortable. The thieves then moved to the security director's office, where they took the video cassettes that recorded their entrance on the closed circuit cameras, as well as the data printouts from the motion detecting equipment. However, the movement data was still captured on a hard drive, which remained untouched. The thieves then took the artwork out of the museum through the side door. The whole thing lasted 81 minutes. In total, they stole 13 works of art with an estimated value in 1990 of $200 million, which today equates to around $600 million. The most valuable works were taken from the Dutch room. Among these was the concert by Dutch painter Vermeer, one of only 34 paintings credited to him. The painting accounts for half of the whole's value, and in 2015 was estimated to be worth around $250 million, making it one of the most valuable stolen objects in the world. However, the strange mix of items the thieves stole puzzled investigators. While some of the works were valuable, the thieves left a priceless painting by Michelangelo undisturbed. The thieves never even entered the third floor where Titans, the Rape of Europa hung, one of the most valuable paintings in the world. Also, the brutish ways the thieves took the artwork from the frames has led investigators to believe the thieves were not experts commissioned to steal particular works. As Illabella's will stated, nothing in a collection should be moved. The empty frames for the stolen paintings remain hanging in their respective locations in the museum in wait for their potential return. Within three days of the robbery, a reward of $1 million was offered for information that leads directly to the recovery of all of the items in good condition. Over the years, the reward has increased and currently stands at $10 million, making it the largest bounty ever offered by a private institution. As the Statue of Limitations expired in 1995, the thieves and anyone who participated in the theft can now not be prosecuted. Early in the investigation, security guard Rick Abbott was investigated because of his suspicious behavior on the night of the theft. When he briefly opened and shut a side door, a move which some believe could have been a signal to the thieves parked outside. However, he and the other guard maintained their innocence and the FBI agent overseeing the case determined the guards were too incompetent and foolish to have pulled off the crime. The only real clue came in 2015 when the FBI released a security video from the museum on the night before the theft, showing Abbott buzzing in an unidentified man into the museum and spoke to him at the security desk. Abbott told investigators he could not recall the incident or recognize the man and so the FBI requested the public's assistance. Several former museum guards came forward and said the stranger was Abbath's boss, the museum's deputy security chief. Apart from that, there has been no progress in the case and the FBI firmly believe that the robbery was planned by a criminal organization, possibly the Boston Mafia. To date, none of the items have ever been recovered. The British Bank of the Middle East Robbery In 1976, the atrocious Lebanese civil war was at its peak, and the capital was split into East and West Beirut. Each side of the combatants was holding one side of the ravaged city, forming a boundary line between then called the Green Line that stretched from North to South. In the midst of the Green Line lay Beirut's financial centre, as did the British Bank of the Middle East, that held deposits of around $300 million, or about $2. billion in today's market. Brazen thieves took advantage of the unrest and the continuous fighting around the bank's area and planned an audacious break-in. In a military-style operation, the perpetrators fired 60mm mortar shells at the combatants of both sides to ignite the battlefield 
and create the perfect distraction for their plans. The British Bank of the Middle East was located in Bab, Idris, and shared a war with the Catholic Church. The thieves knew this was a weak point and burrowed a hole through the church wall, gaining easy access into the bank. Around four hours after entering the bank, the eight heavily armed men successfully created a second hole through the massive steel reinforced vault inside the bank, where all the valuables and money was stored. The group then loaded several vehicles with millions of dollars in stolen cash, jewels, stocks, and hundreds of 99.99% pure 12.5 kilogram gold bars. They then drove away, never to be seen again. To this very day, not one of the perpetrators has been caught, and none of the bank's stolen assets have been recovered. According to Guinness World Records, the heist remains the world's biggest ever bank robbery. It was also one of the most controversial and obscure bank heists in the world, as there are few details due to the chaotic period in which it took place. Over the years, several different versions of the story have emerged, each pointing the finger at various groups and organizations, not just in Lebanon, but around the world. The most popular theories are that either the Palestinian Liberation Organization or the elite British Special Air Service are responsible. However, there is no conclusive evidence to charge either of them. It's worth pointing out that whoever the gang were, they were experts. Gaining access to the bank's vaults using explosives without killing anyone or destroying the safe and its contents is not an easy feat. There is no way of knowing exactly how much was stolen, but estimates were between 20 and 50 million dollars or the equivalent of 133 to 332 million dollars today. Others have exaggerated it to as much as $5 billion in today's terms. Whoever did it, and whatever the loot was worth, the heist of Beirut's British Bank of the Middle East is undoubtedly one of the biggest, most successful unsolved bank heists in history. Bangladesh Bank Cyber Heist Sometime between the 4th and 5th of February in 2016, 35 separate instructions, totaling close to 1 billion US dollars, were issued via the SWIFT network to transfer money to various accounts from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, belonging to Bangladesh Bank. Five of the 35 fraudulent instructions were successful in transferring $101 million. The Federal Reserve Bank blocked the remaining transactions, amounting to $850 million due to suspicions raised by a misspelled instruction. Of the five successful transfers, $20 million was traced to Sri Lanka and $81 million to the Philippines. The $20 million transfer to Sri Lanka was intended to be deposited in the Shalaki Foundation, a Sri Lanka-based private limited company. However, the hackers misspelled foundation in their request, spelling the word foundation. This spelling error alerted the routing bank, Deutsche, and they put a halt to the transaction after seeking clarifications from Bangladesh Bank. All the funds were recovered. The money transferred to the Philippines was deposited in five separate accounts held at the Ritzel Commercial Banking Corporation. The accounts were later found to be under fictitious identities. On February 8, 2016, Bangladesh Bank informed Rizal Commercial Banking Corporation to stop the payments refund the funds, and to freeze and put the funds on hold, if they had already been transferred. But February 8th was a bank holiday in the Philippines, and by the time they received the message, a withdrawal amounting to about $58 million had already been processed. To date, the $58 million has not been recovered. Investigations uncovered suspicious activities of the staff at the Rizal Commercial Banking, who had acted with lightning speed to launder the money out of the bank and into the gambling industry. The forensic investigation found out that malware was installed within the Bangladesh bank system sometime in January 2016, and gathered information on the bank's operational procedures for international payments and fund transfers. The investigation also linked the theft to an unsolved 2013 hacking incident at the Sonali Bank, where $250,000 was stolen by still unidentified hackers in a similar way, and have also been linked to as many as 11 other attacks. 
The FBI in the United States have revealed possible links between the government of North Korea and the theft, and believe some or all of the stolen funds may eventually have found their way to North Korea. To date, investigations are still ongoing, and so far, only a former manager at the Rizal Commercial Banking Corporation has been convicted. In 2019, he was sentenced to four to seven years imprisonment at a Philippine court for money laundering. The theft is one of the biggest in history and highlights the threat of cyber attacks to both government and private institutions by cyber criminals using real bank authorization codes to make orders look genuine. Northern Bank Robbery On the night of Sunday, December 19, 2004, Groups of armed men arrived at the homes of two workers of the Northern Bank of Ireland. One lived in Downpatrick in County Down, the other in Polglass in West Belfast. Masquerading as police officers, they entered the homes and held the workers and their families at gunpoint. Christopher Ward was taken from Polglass to Downpatrick to the home of his supervisor, Kevin McMullen, while gunmen remained at his house with Ward's family. McMullen's wife was taken from their home and held at gunpoint at an unknown location. The following day, both workers were instructed to report for work at the bank's headquarters at Belfast, Dongle Square West as normal. At lunchtime on Monday, December 20th, Ward removed a sum of money from the safe, thought to be around one million pounds, and placed it in a sports holdall. He walked out to the bank's Wellington Street staff entrance with the holdall and made his way up to a bus stop in Queen Street, where he met up with one of the robbers. After handing over the sports holdall with the stolen money, Ward returned to his work location. This was regarded as a test run for the main heist later in the evening. McMullen and Ward remained at work after the close of business, and later in the evening, they gave entry to other members of the gang. The robbers entered the bank via the Wellington Street staff entrance and made their way to the bank's cash handling and storage facility. This held an unusually large amount of cash in preparation for distribution to cash machines for the busy Christmas shopping season. The cash was loaded into several vehicles parked outside the bank and the gang then fled with the money. Shortly before midnight, the gang holding the Ward family left and those holding Miss McMullen released her in a forest. The haul included $10 million of uncirculated Northern Bank Sterling banknotes, 5.5 million pounds of used Northern Bank Sterling notes, 4.5 million of circulated Sterling notes issued by other banks, and small amounts of other currencies, largely Euros and US dollars. Following the raid, Northern Bank announced that it would recall all 300 million pounds worth of its banknotes in denominations of 10 pound or more and reissue them in different colors with a new logo and new serial numbers. The first of these new notes entered circulation on March 11, 2005. On January 7, 2005, investigators issued a report on the robbery in which it blamed the provisional IRA. On January 18, 2005, the provisional IRA issued a two-line statement denying any involvement in the robbery. Over the years, several arrests have been made, and there has been controversy over the police handling of the case and the way evidence was obtained. The only person convicted of any involvement was Co Cork financial advisor Ted Cunningham, who was given a five year suspended sentence for laundering more than £3 million from the hall. Other charges against him were dropped after it was deemed an invalid warrant had been used to search his house. The case against Northern Bank employee Chris Ward also collapsed in 2008, and he was cleared of all charges. The Northern Bank robbery was one of the biggest bank robberies in British and Irish history, with over £26 million stolen. The investigation is still ongoing, but the case remains unsolved. Banco Central Heist on Saturday, August 6, 2005, a gang of burglars tunneled into the Banco Central Bank, located in Fortaleza, in the state of Cura, Brazil, and removed five containers full of 50 real Brazilian notes. 
with an estimated value of about $71.6 million at 2005 exchange rates and weighing about 3.5 tons. The burglars managed to evade or disable the bank's internal alarms and sensors, and the burglary remained undiscovered until the bank opened for business the following Monday. The notes stolen were waiting to be examined to decide whether it should be recirculated or destroyed. The bills were not numbered sequentially, making them almost impossible to trace. The planning that went into the robbery started three months earlier, when the perpetrators rented a commercial property in the center of the city. They renovated the property and put up a sign indicating it was a landscaping company, selling both natural and artificial grass as well as plants. Because of the nature of the business, neighbors thought nothing of the van loads of soil being removed daily, believing it to be a normal activity of the business. In reality, the gang were tunneling from beneath the property, two city blocks to a position underneath the bank. The tunnel was roughly 70 centimeters square and running four meters beneath the surface. It was well constructed, lined with wood and plastic and had lighting and air circulating systems. On the weekend of the robbery, the bank broke through 1.1 meters of steel reinforced concrete to enter the bank vault. The volume and weight of the money stolen meant it would have taken a considerable amount of time to remove and transport it. They used sophisticated equipment, including GPS, and must have been experts in mathematics, engineering, and excavation. When they left the rented property, several tools were recovered, but everything was covered in burnt lime to avoid fingerprints. Over the years, several suspects have been arrested and batches of money have been recovered. However, the heist spawned various other crimes, including kidnap and murder. On October 20th, 2005, the body of one of the alleged masterminds, Louis Ribeiro, was found on an isolated road 200 miles west of Rio de Janeiro. He had been shot seven times. After the robbery, he fled from the area to Sao Paulo, but was kidnapped on October 7th, 2005. His family paid 893,600 Brazil real in ransom, but he was killed instead of being freed. There were signs that police officers were involved in the kidnapping and killing, and three of them were arrested. In total, there were at least six kidnappings the police discovered relating to the robbery, and in all cases, the relatives of the victims paid the ransom. On October 3rd, 2006, the body of another suspect was found in Sao Paulo. So far, authorities have recovered only about 20 million Brazil real, over $3.5 million. But to date, the whereabouts of the other 60 million is unknown, and at least 18 suspects remain at large. It seems though in this case, crime doesn't pay, and has left a trail of death and heartache in its wake. Flight 967 Varagi On the 30th of January 1979, Varagi Flight 967 departed Narisha International Airport in Tokyo for a cargo flight to Rio de Janeiro International Airport in Brazil. On board were six flight crew, the captain, the first officer, two second officers, and two flight engineers, as well as cargo of over 50 paintings by the Japanese-Brazilian artist Manabu Mabe. With an estimated worth of over a million US dollars, the paintings were being shipped back home to Mabe's home in Brazil after an exhibition in Tokyo. The flight route plan included stops in Los Angeles, California, and Lima. The captain that day was Gilberto Arruja da Silva, who was considered a hero in France and Brazil after, in 1973, he landed Flight 820 in Onion Field south of Orly after a fire broke out in a toilet. By steering the stricken plane to a field, he avoided crashing into a populated area of Paris. And although 123 people lost their lives, the figure would have been far higher if it wasn't for the action taken by Gilberto. He was also a very experienced pilot with more than 23,000 hours flying time logged. Flight 967 departed on time and 20 minutes after takeoff, the crew contacted Narita Tower for a routine checking reporting that they were 500 kilometers from the coast, about 300 miles. The next call was expected about 40 minutes later, but never came. 
the tower controllers frantically tried to make contact for the next hour, but received no response. They declared an emergency, and the Japanese Air Force and Navy immediately set up a search. The following day, the Japanese Coast Guard and the US Air Force joined the search. Aircraft and ships scoured the area for the next eight days, trying to find any sign of the Boeing 707, but no wreckage or trace of the cargo and crew were ever found. At the time, the Brazilian media stated that it was the only commercial jet to have disappeared without leaving a single trace, with no distress message and no wreckage found. Speculation was rife, and many believed that the aircraft had been hijacked in order to steal the artwork, however none of the paintings have ever resurfaced. Others believed that the aircraft had drifted into Soviet territory and was shot down, just as Korean Airlines 902 had been just the year before. Either that, or it was intercepted and forced to land in the Soviet Union. As rumours circulated that as well as the paintings, the cargo included a dismantled MiG-25 that three years earlier had been flown into a Japanese airport by Soviet defector Viktor Belinko. At the time, the then US President George H.W. Bush called the opportunity to examine the plane up close, an intelligent bonanza for the West. Belenko was later offered asylum by the US. It seems likely that the Soviet military would do almost anything to keep their powerful fighter jet out of American hands. However, it was later established the Midge was not part of the cargo, although the Soviets wouldn't have known that at the time. Then of course there were those that believed the aircraft had been abducted by aliens. The investigation into the disappearance of the plane, however, gave no credence to any of these theories, instead concluding, the flight suffered an unexpected depressurization, causing the crew to lose consciousness about 30 minutes after takeoff, with the Boeing continuing on the same altitude and heading until it ran out of fuel and crashed somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. To date, that is where the story ends. There have been no updates and no further leads, and it's unlikely we will ever find out what happened to the flight and its crew. The Stolen 727 On May 25, 2003, shortly before sunset, aircraft mechanic Ben Padilla boarded a Boeing 727-223. With him was a helper he had recently hired, John Matantu, from the Republic of the Congo. The two had been working with Anglin mechanics to return the 727 to flight-ready status so they could reclaim it from a business deal gone bad. However, John was not a pilot, and Ben had only a private pilot's license, and a 727 ordinarily requires three trained aircrew. It would have been nearly impossible for just two men to have operated this kind of plane. There is speculation that a third unseen person may have hopped aboard as well, or was already in the aircraft. Whatever the situation, without receiving clearance, the aircraft began moving erratically down the runway at an airport in Angola. There was no communication with air traffic controllers before it took off without lights and headed southwest over the Atlantic Ocean and then disappeared. The 28-year-old plane had a bit of a checkered background. It was once owned by American Airlines and was still partially decorated in the airline's signature metal look with red, white and blue livery but it had recently been sold to US company Aerospace Sales and Leasing, and leased to TAAG and Gola Airlines, reportedly to use in the diamond mines of West Africa. However, it failed to be used in over a year, and the airline racked up a reported 4 million US dollar bill in airport fees. Ben and John were hired to convert the aircraft to be used by another carrier, IRS Airlines and when it took off, it had no seats and was carrying 10 500-gallon fuel tanks. It was a complete mystery why these two men would steal the plane, and it was thought there was more to it than simple theft. The FBI, CIA, State Department and Homeland Security all frantically investigated the disappearance, and the search for the plane stretched worldwide. The disappearance was just 21 months after 9-11, and terrorism was suspected. Rumours started circulating that maybe the plane was stolen for insurance purposes by the owners, or that it had been stolen with the intent to make it available to the criminal fraternity, or it was indeed a deliberate terrorist attempt. The fact that the FBI got involved suggests they knew more than they were letting on, 
and Ben's family have fought to get the case reopened as they believe the agency knows more than it will admit to. Over the years, there have been reported sightings of the plane, although they have never been verified. Then in early 2009, the wreckage of a 727 was discovered abandoned in the Sahara Desert of Mali in West Africa. At first it was believed that the Boeing must have crash landed there, but further investigation revealed that an ancient lake bed nearby had been converted into a makeshift airstrip, and that the aircraft had been landed there before being deliberately set on fire. Inquiries about the origins of the plane were hampered by the fact that it had been marked with the registration of a Saudi airline, although the real 727 with that registration had been destroyed in an accident some time before. An international criminal investigation linked it to the smuggling of huge amounts of cash and cocaine between Colombia, West Africa and Europe. On its final journey, according to a UN crime agency, it was carrying some 10 tons of cocaine when it landed. It was met by nine jeeps bearing false number plates that took its cargo for distribution across Europe, while the plane itself was destroyed by the smugglers. Now it's never been proved that this 727 was the stolen Angola one, and no trace of either John or Ben has ever been found. But given that it's very hard to steal and conceal a Boeing 727, the chances are that seeing as this plane has been deliberately disguised, buried and destroyed, there is a strong possibility it's the same plane. But where Ben and John are is still a mystery. And there are still so many unanswered questions. Were they flying the plane? Was it hijacked? Was there a bomb on board? Did it crash over the ocean? Or was it repainted and used somewhere else and ended up in the desert? To date, there are no answers and the case remains just as baffling as the day the 727 took off all those years ago. Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 2501 on the 23rd of June 1950, Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 2501 was flying from New York's LaGuardia Airport to Seattle, Washington, when it disappeared into the night. Northwest Airlines Corps was a US airline which was founded in 1926, primarily to carry US mail. The aircraft for Flight 2501 was a DC-4 which had been manufactured in 1943 it was originally operated by the United States Air Force, and then by a postal operation before being purchased by Northwest in 1943. The end of the war meant that many surplus aircraft were sold to fledgling commercial airlines. It was used for a cargo service initially, but in 1950, one month before the crash, it was converted to a 55-passenger cargo coach aircraft. Flight 2501 was one of the DC-4 routes, a transcontinental service from New York to Seattle. The aircraft was in good repair and all the maintenance records were in order. The flight crew who had flown the aircraft to LaGuardia reported it as mechanically okay before going off shift. All times are given as central standard, which was the time zone for the believed accident location. At 15.45 that day, Northwest released a special thunderstorm forecast at around 6pm on June 23rd, 1950, the flight crew of the Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 2501 arrived at the Northwest Flight Control Office, an hour before their scheduled departure. They discussed the weather situation with the dispatcher and examined the hourly sequence reports. The forecast was for thunderstorms in the Detroit, Minneapolis area, with moderate to severe turbulence above 10,000 feet and light to moderate turbulence below 10,000 feet. There was also a risk of a squall line developing. A squall line means heavy rain, hail, lightning, strong winds, and even tornadoes. Due to the conditions, the captain and the dispatcher decided on a cruising altitude of 4,000 feet, which seems very low for a transcontinental flight by today's standards. The flight routes had them stopping over at Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Spokane, before reaching their destination of Seattle. Before takeoff, the captain requested an altitude of 4,000 feet for the initial routing to Minneapolis, but air traffic controllers were unable to approve it, as they had other traffic assigned at that level. So the final flight plan had a cruising altitude of 6,000 feet to Minneapolis. The pre-flight check was normal, and there was no reason to think that there was anything wrong with the aircraft. 
The flight departed LaGuardia Airport at 19.31 with two flight crew and one cabin crew member along with 55 passengers on board, including two families traveling with their children and three pregnant women. One of the passengers was so late he almost missed the flight and the cabin crew had to open the cabin door to let him aboard. The plane flew over Cleveland, Ohio at 21.49. The flight crew again requested a cruising altitude of 4,000 feet, which this time was approved. However, 40 minutes later, air traffic control asked them to descend to 3,500 feet, as other planes were experiencing turbulence due to the conditions. At 22.51, Flight 2501 was flying over Battle Creek at 3,500 feet, and reported that they expected to be over Milwaukee at 37 minutes past 11, although the radio operator incorrectly copied this down as 27 minutes past 11. At 13 minutes past 11, the flight crew requested a cruising altitude of 2,500 feet. They didn't say why, nor did they declare an emergency. Air traffic control declined the request, as there was other traffic at that level. The flight crew acknowledged that the descent was not approved, and the flight continued at 3,500 feet. This was the last communication from the flight. In Milwaukee, radio operators became concerned when the crew didn't check in at 37 minutes past 11 as expected. 10 minutes later, Northwest Radio still had not heard from the flight. Hoping that this was a communication failure, the controllers broadcast that the flight should circle the range station at Madison if its radio transmitter was inoperative. Meanwhile, all CAA radio stations in the Chicago, Minneapolis area attempted to contact the flight on all frequencies with no success. Northwest contacted Chicago Air Traffic Control, who altered the air sea rescue facilities in the area at 58 minutes past 11. Responders included the Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard, as well as the State Police of Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Indiana. By dawn, it was time to face facts. No word was heard from the aircraft crew, and if they'd still be flying, the fuel supply would have run out by now. So they concluded the aircraft must be down. Search and rescue operations started searching Foggy Lake, Michigan as soon as the sun rose. The following morning, the search and rescue operation was expanded to include underwater searches. They loaded the boats with sonar equipment and sent divers down where strong sonar contacts were made. The lake was 150 feet deep in these locations and the lake bottom was covered by a layer of silt and mud, estimated to be 30 to 40 feet deep. The entire area was also dragged with grapnel hooks in the hopes of pulling something to the surface, but to no avail. That evening, after 11 hours of searching, a US Coast Guard discovered an oil slick on Lake Michigan, about 18 miles northwest of Benton Harbor. Meteorological reports confirmed that a squall line was located there at the time that the aircraft was believed to have crashed. The US Coast Guard also found the aircraft logbook floating in the water, Further floating fragments were found in the area, but they could not find the aircraft wreckage. After four days of intense searching, the Navy suspended their search because of the difficult conditions, and the official search was over. The only pieces of the aircraft which were recovered were things that floated like phone cushions, armrests, clothing, blankets, pillows, and pieces of luggage. These recovered items showed no sign of fire but were shredded, indicating that the aircraft must have struck the water at high speed. Soon, body parts began to wash up on the shore. Some were also described as shredded, and officials initially believed that there must have been a terrible mid-air explosion to disintegrate the body so badly. South Beach, popular with tourists, was forced to close because of the large number of body parts that washed in. Years later, two unmarked grave sites were identified, which are believed to hold the remains of the flight crash victims which washed ashore. They were buried quickly and quietly, as only small pieces were found. One is a mass grave in a cemetery near St. Joseph, and the other at Lakeview Cemetery in South Haven. Both sites now have markers in the memory of the victims. The only debris recovered offering any information about the flight was a plywood oxygen bottle support bracket. This bracket had been installed on the forward left side of the fuselage, which meant that the impact force which ripped it off must have been forward, downward, and to the left. This indicated that perhaps the aircraft had turned on its back in high winds. 
Usually the flight crew would have enough height to recover. But as Flight 2501 was only at 3,500 feet, they had no chance. At the time the crash was the deadliest commercial airliner accident that the United States had ever experienced, and no cause could be determined. To this day, the mystery continues. It's known the plane struck the water with considerable force, but why is unknown. It's possible that there was a mechanical failure mid-flight, but the aircraft appeared to be in good condition, and normally the flight crew would have reported as soon as they realized there were any issues. The Michigan Shipwreck Research Associates had searched Lake Michigan for the aircraft wreckage every year for over a decade. But even if they find the wreckage, they won't find the black box. As in 1950, commercial aircraft did not carry them. Over 60 years later, the aircraft has still not been found. The 1956 B-47 Disappearance on March the 10th, 1956, a Boeing B-47 Stratajet took off from the MacDill Air Force Base in Florida for a non-stop flight to Bangiria Air Base in Morocco. On board were Captain Robert H. Hodgen, the aircraft commander, Captain Gordon M. Inslee, observer, and Second Lieutenant Ronald L. Kurtz, the pilot. The unarmed aircraft was transporting two different capsules of nuclear weapons material in carrying cases although it's worth pointing out, a nuclear detonation was not possible. The aircraft completed the first of its two aerial refuelings without incident. However, after descending through solid cloud cover to begin its second refuelling at 14,000 feet, it failed to make contact with its tanker. Its last known position was over or near the Mediterranean Sea, southeast of Port Say, an Algerian coastal village near the Moroccan frontier. This was the last anyone seen or heard of the plane and its three crew. Despite an extensive search by plane and sea, no debris was ever found and the crash site has never been located. The three crew members have since been declared dead. It's a complete mystery how an aircraft, its cargo and its crew completely disappeared off the face of the earth. This incident is one of the rare occasions when absolutely nothing turns up, despite investigators knowing roughly where the plane lost contact. The 64-year-old mystery rumbles on, with the usual speculation that other forces were at work, that either hijacked or downed the B-47. The Flying Tiger Line At 5.45 GMT on 14th of March 1962, Flying Tiger Line Flight 739 departed Travis Air Force Base. On board, 11 crew and 96 passengers. The flight chartered by the United States military was heading to Saigon in South Vietnam, with refueling stops in Honolulu, Wake Island, Guam, and the Philippines. 93 of the passengers were jungle-trained army rangers, primarily highly trained electronics and communications specialists. The other three were members of the armed forces of Vietnam. The cargo consisted only of passenger baggage, personal articles, and clothing. The flight proceeded normally for the next 12 hours, arriving in Honolulu at 1744 GMT. There the aircraft went through minor maintenance and no issues of concern were found. The next departure was at 2040. The flight arrived at Wake Island at 354 on the 15th of March 1962. Again, minor maintenance was required and four cabin crews were replaced. The flight departed for Guam at 515 this leg was six hours, and the flight arrived in Guam at 11.14. The next leg to Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines was estimated at six hours and 19 minutes. The aircraft had enough fuel for nine hours and 30 minutes. The aircraft departed Guam at 12.57. At 13.25, the flight crew contacted Guam International Flight Service Station to request a change in cruising altitude from 10,000 feet to 18,000 feet. No reason was given for the request, and the flight crew were advised to contact Guam Center, who approved the request. The last transmission from the aircraft took place at 14.22. The flight crew contacted Guam International Flight Service Station and reported cruising over the clouds at 18,000 feet. They expected to arrive at Clark Air Force Base at 19.16 and said that they had 18 hours and 12 minutes of fuel remaining. All of the radio calls were completely routine, and there was no indication of any problem or difficulties. 
At 15.39, the operator attempted to contact Flight 739 in order to receive the now overdue 15.30 position report. He was unable to establish radio contact. At 16.33, after attempts to contact the aircraft had failed for over an hour, there was fear the aircraft was in danger and search and rescue operations were initiated from Guam and the Philippines. At 22.27, by time, the aircraft would have exhausted all of its fuel Tiger Flying Lines Flight 739 and all of its occupants were declared lost. The fate of the aircraft was unknown, however a call came in from a ship out at sea. The lookouts had seen a mid-air explosion at 15.30. They explained the explosion consisted of two pulses lasting two to three seconds. The crew believed they saw two flaming objects of equal brightness and size fall at different speeds into the sea. As they fell, a crew member noticed a small bright target on the ship's radar, bearing 270 degrees at a range of 17 miles. The ship's captain ordered the ship to head to the target, and they searched the area for five and a half hours, but found no trace of wreckage or debris. At the time, the crew were unable to establish contact with the US Navy radio stations at Manila or Guam, and eventually decided that the explosion must have been some kind of military or naval exercise. The ship then broke off the surge and resumed her course. The approximate location of the mid-air explosion was confirmed to coincide with the estimated position of the aircraft at that time, and coincidentally, it was at the point when Flight 739 should have been radioing in for the next position report. The subsequent search of the site was one of the most extensive ever conducted, however no trace of the aircraft or its occupants was ever found. No explanation for its loss could be established, and although the plane had had mechanical issues in the weeks leading up to the disappearance, they had been fixed and it was in good order. Many believe the aircraft may have been sabotaged. The investigation found that the flight line and ramp areas at Honolulu, Wake Island and Guam were not secure, and anyone could enter and access non-military aircrafts parked at the airfields. Specifically at Guam, the last stop, the aircraft was left unattended in a dimly lit area for some time. Although the Flying Tiger Line stated at the time that sabotage or kidnapping of Flight 739 was a possibility, they had no evidence to back up the theory. But the executive vice president of the company was reported as saying that it was impossible for an explosion to occur on the plane in the course of normal operation, meaning something violent must have happened. Whatever happened must have happened quickly, as the crew never had a chance to alert anyone that there was an emergency. As no one has ever taken responsibility for sabotaging the aircraft and the wreckage, and the unwreckage is unlikely to be recovered, this is a mystery that may remain unsolved forever. SS Pachimo, the ghost ship of the Arctic. SS Pachimo was a steel-hulled, 1,322-ton cargo steamer built in 1914 in Sweden. Since her construction and launch, she was used on trading routes between Hamburg and Sweden until the First World War began in August 1914. After the war, she was transferred to the United Kingdom as part of Germany's reparations for shipping losses and was acquired by the Hudson's Bay Company in 1921 who renamed her from Anger Manafulven to SS Bechimo. From her new base in Scotland, she completed nine successful voyages along the north coast of Canada, visiting trading posts and collecting pelts. However, on October 1st, 1931, at the end of a trading run and loaded with a cargo of fur, she became trapped in pack ice. The crew briefly abandoned the ship traveling over a half mile on ice to the town of Barrow to take shelter for two days. But by the time they returned, the ship had broken free. The crew reboarded, but shortly after the ship became ensnared again, and on the 15th of October, the Hudson's Bay Company sent aircraft to retrieve 22 of the crew. 15 of them remained behind, intending to wait out the winter. They left the ship and constructed a wooden shelter some distance away. Then on November 24th, a powerful blizzard struck, and after it dissipated, there was no sign of Pachimo. Her captain decided she must have broken up during the storm and sunk. 
However, a few days later, an Inuit seal hunter told the captain that he had seen Bachimo about 45 miles away from their position. The crewman tracked her down, but decided she was unlikely to survive the winter and removed the most valuable furs from the hold, and she was left abandoned. But surprisingly, Bachimo did not sink. Instead, she drifted around on her own in the freezing waters, repeatedly becoming stuck in ice and then freeing herself to resume drifting again. She was sighted numerous times, still unmanned and adrift for nearly 40 years. Sailors managed to board her several times over the years, but each time they were either unequipped to salvage her or were driven away by bad weather. The last recorded sighting of her was by a group of Inuit in 1969, a full 38 years after she was abandoned. She was yet again stuck fast in the pack of ice, the Beaufort Sea between Point Barrow and Icy Cape off the northwestern Alaskan coast. Her ultimate fate to this day is unknown. She could still be floating around somewhere or forever preserved in packed ice. In 2006, the Alaskan government began work on a project to solve the mystery of what has become known as the ghost ship of the Arctic and try and locate Bachimo, whether still afloat or on the ocean floor. As of 2020, she has still not been found. Atsurobun Atsurobun is Japanese for hollow boat and the term used for a strange Japanese legend. The following incident was recorded in three different manuscripts, all written within a few years of the alleged event. The stories of the Garden of Rabbits, diaries and stories of castaways, and peach powder. All three refer to the same event with only the smallest variation in the description and outcome. On February 22nd, 1803, a group of fishermen from the Hitachi region of Japan spotted a boat floating in the Pacific Ocean close to the shore. The vessel was a hollowed out capsule made of wood carved into the shape of an incense burner or a rice pit, measuring about 3.3 meters high by 5.4 meters wide. The bottom of the boat was covered with copper plates that protected it from the treacherous rocks along the coastline. It also had glass windows that were held in place by wooden strips secured with resin. The fishermen decided to bring the boat ashore to investigate. Once at shore, inside they found inscriptions on the walls written in an unknown language. There was water, food, bedding, and carpets, along with a mysterious young woman. She was described as strange, with red eyebrows, aged about 18 or 20 years old. She was small, measuring around 1.5 meters, with pale skin and red hair embellished with white extensions that appeared to be made of skin or finely cut fabric. The girl wore long garments made of an unknown fabric and in her hands, she held tightly to a light colored box. The fisherman tried to communicate with her, but she spoke an unknown language and behaved in a bizarre way. She refused to let them touch the small box and guarded it jealously. The fishermen were so frightened and confused about what they had found and decided to put the girl back into the capsule and return it to the sea. When the locals heard the story, some suspected that she was the queen of a distant country who had been accused of adultery and exiled to sea. Others speculated that the little box might contain the head of her lover. For years, the mystery of the Utsura Boon has passed through generations and interested historians, anthropologists, ethnologists, and UFO enthusiasts alike. For some, the story is just Japanese folklore and myth, but for others, the legend of the young woman is one of the earliest records of contact with beings from another planet. They compare the strange symbols found on the walls of the ship with those at other sites of supposed contact with extraterrestrials and the shape of the hollow ship with flying saucers. Whatever the explanation, the mystery endures and is firmly embedded in Japanese folklore. What do you think of this one? High aim number six, the modern day Mary Celeste. On October 31st, 2002, an 80-foot long line fishing boat named High aim number six left the port of Lucio in southern Taiwan. The vessel was registered in Taiwan, but flew under an Indonesian flag. 
Two months later, on the 8th of January 2003, the Australian Navy came across the crewless vessel, drifting approximately 80 nautical miles east of Broly Shoals, inside the Australian Exclusive Economic Zone. After boarding the boat, they found it was on full throttle, with the main gas tank dry, and there was no obvious reason for the abandonment. No signs of distress were found, and the crew's personal effects remained on board, including seven toothbrushes, a half carton of Marlboro cigarettes, a jar of coffee, along with the captain's reading glasses. The crew members' clothes and documents were stored neatly where they should be. She had plenty of fuel and provisions, and no sign of a struggle could be found. But the crew had vanished. Initial concerns that the ship had been carrying illegal immigrants were soon dismissed. When they discovered 10 tons of viable Bonito tuna in the refrigerated hold, the High Aim 6 was towed to Broome, where forensic examination was conducted and a search for the crew was commenced. That spanned across 7,300 nautical miles, but no trace was found. The owner of the ship confirmed that he had last spoke with the captain in December 2002. Phone records indicate that over a week after the boat was discovered, local calls were still being made from Indonesia using the cell phone of the boat engineer. After checking the call records, the Taiwanese police deemed a mutiny was probable. However, the Indonesian police could only track down one member of the 10 believed to be involved. According to his declaration, members of the crew had killed the captain and the engineer on December 8th and then proceeded to go back to their homeland. But he never gave a clear explanation as to the motive and the details of the takeover. High Aim 6 sat beached on the sand beach of Broome for about a year, becoming a popular tourist attraction. Locals had hoped the ship would be dragged offshore and scuttled to be used as a dive wreck, but the ship was dismantled and transferred to a local landfill a year after its discovery. The whereabouts of the crew, the reason for the mutiny, and the circumstances of the alleged murders still remain a complete mystery. Ghost Ship Jenny. Now this next one is like something out of a horror movie and the subject of a long-standing but still unproven legend. The Jenny was an English schooner that left her home port on the Isle of Wight in 1822, but never reached her destination. She was presumed lost at sea along with her crew. However, in September 1840, 18 years after her disappearance, Jenny was discovered by the whaling ship, Hope, frozen in an ice barrier of the Drake Passage, a body of water between South America's Cape Horn, Chile, and the southern Shetland Islands of Antarctica. Captain Brighton, the Hope's captain, ordered his crew to board the stricken Jenny, and what they found was horrific. The Antarctic cold had perfectly preserved all of the crew's bodies, and they were scattered around the ship like ice statues. The captain was frozen at his desk, where an open log's last entry read, May 4, 1823. No food for 71 days. I am the only one left alive. Captain Brighton received the ship's log that revealed her last port call was a location in Peru. Brighton took the log and intended to return it to the ship's owner, but no attempt was made to retrieve the bodies. The account of the horrific find didn't appear until many years later in 1862 in an anonymous article in an edition of Globus, a popular German geographical magazine, and questions have always been raised about how true the story is. Although there appears to be some truth in the tale, and a rock named the Jenny Buttress that overlooks Destruction Bay on the east side of King George Island in the South Shetland Islands, was named in memory of the ship and her lost crew. What became of the ship and the bodies are unknown, and they could very well be preserved in ice somewhere in the Antarctic. A very creepy thought. Scientists successfully retrieve 100 million year old microbes from the seabed. Now, this is a relatively new discovery, and it shows how little we know about life and how much we still have to learn especially when it comes to the ocean. 
New research published in the journal Nature Communications in July 2020 revealed that scientists have successfully revived microbes that had lain dormant at the bottom of the sea since the age of the dinosaurs. The microbes were discovered after an analysis of ancient sediment samples deposited more than 100 million years ago, deep beneath the seabed of the South Pacific Ocean. The area they were found is renowned for having far fewer nutrients in its sediment than usual, making it a far from ideal site to maintain life. The revival process was carried out by a team led by the Japan Agency for Marine Earth Science and Technology. The team incubated the samples to help coax the microbes out of their epoch-spanning slumber, and astonishingly, scientists found the deep-sea microorganisms were capable of eating, growing, and dividing, after remaining in an energy-saving state for millions of years. Even more astonishing is they were able to revive nearly all of the microorganisms detected. Their research sheds light on the remarkable survival power of some of Earth's most primitive species, which can exist for tens of millions of years with barely any oxygen or food, before being brought back to life in a lab. Scientists now know that there is no age limit for organisms in the sub seafloor biosphere. The oxygen traces in the sediment allowed the microbes to stay alive for billions of years while expending virtually no energy. Energy levels for seabed microbes are millions of times lower than that of surface microbes, although it still remains a mystery as to how the seabed organisms had managed to survive for so long. Now, although this one is very different to the previous four topics we just mentioned, we wanted to end on this one, as this will really open your mind to other life forms forming on other planets. This finding opens up a real possibility of finding life in the most inhospitable conditions imaginable, and that could very well include planets other than Earth. What's your thoughts? The Vanished Roanoke Island Colony in 1584, English settlers arriving in the New World attempted to set up a colony on Roanoke Island, North Carolina. However, after less than a year, they abandoned their plans due to severe weather, lack of supplies, and poor relations with the indigenous people. Three years later, they tried again, and in 1587, Virginia Dare was born, the granddaughter of Captain John White, one of the founders of the colony. Virginia was said to be the first English-born child in the New World. But all was not well for the settlers, and Captain John was forced to leave his family and return to England to obtain supplies. John remained in England for the next three years, as the Queen had forbidden all shipping due to Spanish Armada attacks on England. When he finally returned to Roanoke Island in 1590, the settlers, along with his family, had vanished. It is said that all he found was the words crow and croatoan carved on two trees. When John saw these words, he believed that the settlers had sought the help of the Croatan Indians on the nearby Hatteras Island. He was, however, puzzled, as before he left for England, it had been decided by the group that should they move during his absence due to disaster or attack, a Maltese cross image would be left behind to indicate this. However, no such symbol was found. John knew the settlers had established good relations with the Croatans, so it was plausible for him to assume that the colonists had gone there. Yet due to the terrible weather conditions, White was unable to investigate the matter further and decided to go back to England instead, leaving behind the mysterious disappearance of the colony and his family. White never returned to the New World and never heard from his family again. To this day, their fate, and that of the other settlers is unknown. So what happened to them? One of the theories is that they managed to integrate themselves with the Croatan people. This theory is backed up by historians, who wrote of a tribe of North Carolina Indians, who spoke English fluently, practiced Christianity, and called themselves Croatan Indians. Also, there were between 20 and 30 English surnames from the Roanoke settlers found in the Croatan tribe suggesting that integration between the two peoples had happened. But by the early 17th century, the Croatans had become extinct, but their direct descendants, the Lumbi, who still exist today, appear to have prominent European features. 
By 1650, the Lumbee had migrated and settled in Robson County. Although the intermarriage between the Croatans and the missing English settlers is the most popular explanation for the origins of the Lumbee, it is not accepted by all. Some believe that a darker fate befell the settlers. Many believe cannibalism by local tribes was responsible for their disappearance, and this accounts for the lack of human remains found at the site. Others suggest the settlers died of disease or starvation, or that they perished at sea while desperately trying to return to England. Then in 1937, Louis E. Hammond, a California tourist, found a stone by the east bank of the Chowan River in Chowan County, North Carolina. The stone weighed around 21 pounds and was covered in markings that Hammond couldn't decipher. He took it to Emory University, asking for help to interpret the markings. The inscription was interpreted as a message from Eleanor White Dare, John's daughter and mother of Virginia. It appeared to be an update to her father. This is their interpretation. After the find, a group of Emory professors travelled with Hammond to the site where he claimed to have discovered the stone. They could not determine the precise location of the find, but the trip convinced the professors that Hammond was telling the truth. The discovery prompted a wave of other stones being found, 47 in total, and they collectively became known as the Dare Stones. The stones were inscribed with messages, supposedly written by members of the lost Roanoke colony. The stones created a media circus in the United States, as the public became fascinated with the possible resolution of the lost colony's fate. However, the 47 stones found after Hammond's discovery were of a markedly different style and were eventually connected to a Georgia stonecutter and discredited. By 1941, scholars and the press had dismissed all of the Dare stones as hoaxes. Although the authenticity of Hammond's original stone has not been conclusively proven or disproven, and recently, researchers have taken another look at the first Dare stone, declaring if it's real, it's the most significant artifact in American history of early European settlement. And if it's not, it's one of the most magnificent forgeries of all time. The stone may hold the key to finding out what actually happened to the settlers who vanished on Roanoke Island, but for now, it still remains a mystery. Devil's Kettle Falls At the waterfalls along Lake Superior's north shore, a river forks at a rock outcropping. While one side tumbles down a two-step stone embankment and continues on like a typical waterfall, the other side vanishes into a deep hole and disappears. The spot is known as the Devil's Kettle, located in Judge C. R. Magny State Park in the US state of Minnesota. Where the water goes when it flows into the gigantic hole has baffled tourists and geologists for generations. Park visitors and curious minds have tested different theories as to where the water ends up by dropping sticks, coloured ping pong balls, GPS devices and other objects into the hole without ever seeing them resurface downstream. Other reports have circulated, including a young man who rappelled 26 feet into the hole. Stories like that led to speculation that the waterfall must have a separate unknown outlet into Lake Superior or that the water plunges deep into the Earth's crust. One thing is for sure, it is no doubt impressive. For years, where all that water went was a mystery. However, in February 2017, Minnesota's Department of Natural Resources strongly indicated after a series of experiments that the water simply flows back into the river at the bottom of the falls. But if it's really that simple, why has nothing ever been recovered in any of the ping pong ball experiments or anything else that has been dropped into the hole? While well, experts who carried out the official experiments explained that the pressure of the plunge explains why no objects have ever resurfaced. 
Since the force of that plunge is so great, any objects would be held down and pulverized into nothing, never reappearing. However, their experiments fail to establish exactly where the water is re-emerging, but they suspect it empties out right below where it flows in. It was decided that further experiments would be done to establish the outlet. They wanted to drop a chemical dye into the hole with hopes that they would see the dye resurface at the bottom of the falls. It was the last test to be conducted to finally prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that there was in fact no mystery at all. But it seems the announcement caused another mystery, as to date that experiment has not been carried out, and apparently park management deemed it unnecessary, stating that it was not scientifically necessary to confirm that the water simply rejoins the river below the falls. This has caused more speculation, with many now questioning the untesting scientific theory, believing the mystery of where the devil's kettle's water goes. What do you think? The Star Jelly A star jelly are blobs of gelatinous substance that appear on the ground, generally in rural areas. The blobs have been observed in a variety of translucent colours, ranging from white to luminous yellow. They are usually quite small, although large masses have been reported. The goo often evaporates shortly after appearing. But what are they, and where do they come from? Folklore suggests that the jelly falls from the stars during meteor showers. Others believe they are a kind of fungus. Some of the more bizarre theories are that they are a communication method from the dead, something excreted by aliens or a part of a government conspiracy to poison us. But in reality, no one knows what the mysterious substance is. The first recorded mention of the jelly was in the 14th century when it was suggested it could be used to treat abscesses. It was also around this time that its name evolved from a star which has fallen to star slime, then finally to star jelly. In Mexico, locals even refer to it as moon excrement. In 1979, Fate magazine claimed they had solved the mystery of the gooey substance, saying it consisted of extraterrestrial cellular organic matter, which exists as pre-stellar molecular clouds. However, this claim has widely been dismissed as it's very unlikely that the jelly comes from clouds. Even the closest molecule cloud to Earth, the Taurus molecule cloud, is 430 light years away. Besides, most of the material in these clouds consists of gases and dust, not jelly-like goo. It is also unlikely that the substance comes from meteors, aka falling stars, as meteors rarely make it to the ground as they burn up in our atmosphere. Even if they did have a jelly element, it would never make it to the ground. Additionally, although it's assumed it falls from the sky, there are no account of anyone witnessing it. They just report finding the jelly in the morning after a meteor shower. A more plausible idea is that the gelatinous substance could be the remains of frogs, toads, worms, or other creatures, perhaps after a predator has spit them out. Another theory is that the substance is actually a type of algae the blue algae, for example, forms colonies made up of cells in a gelatinous sheath. It's hard to see on the ground, but once it rains, it swells up. Another suggestion is it's connected to female amphibian reproduction. The spawn is held in a substance known as glycoprotein, which is stored in the female's body. But if the animal is attacked by a predator or scared, it will quite naturally drop its spawn and the associated glycoprotein. The glycoprotein is designed to swell on contact with water, or dewy ground, much like the algae mentioned earlier. However, no frog spawn has ever approached the size of some reported cases of star jelly. There is one problem with this theory, however. When the jelly was tested, it was concluded that the specimen did not contain any DNA, plant or animal. So it's unlikely that the substance has a connection with the animal or plant life in question although it's worth pointing out that this was just one sample. Slime molds is another possibility. They can appear suddenly, exhibit a very gelatinous appearance at first, and later change to a dust-like form, which is dispersed by rain and wind. The colours range from striking pure white to pink, purple, bright yellow, orange and brown, depending on the species. 
However, ultimately, no one really knows what causes star jelly, as it doesn't hang around long enough to be properly studied. So for now, this one is unsolved and still up for debate. If you ever see a blob of strange jelly-like goo on your morning walk, it's probably best to leave it alone. When nature tricked us for years. Now this one is kind of solved, but it's still a great example of nature messing with our heads. Scattered across the world are several bewildering mysterious spots that appear to defy gravity. Places where cars seem to drift uphill and cyclists struggle to push themselves downhill. They seem to defy the laws of physics. These bizarre areas are known as gravity hills and can be found in the US, the UK, Australia, Brazil, Italy, and Canada. One of which my wife and I visited ourselves during a trip to Canada. Many have become tourist attractions with people flocking to the area to experience the phenomena for themselves. Of course, these areas have spawned all sorts of rumors over the years from unknown forces pulling you upwards to witchcraft and giant magnets buried in the countryside. However, there is an explanation for this bizarre phenomenon, and it appears that it is nature getting the last laugh. It turns out they are just optical illusions, an illusion so good it can be impossible to believe with your own eyes, and you would need the proper equipment to prove it. If you get surveying equipment or GPS markers to measure the difference between the top of the slope and the bottom, you'll realize that everything is actually in reverse. The hills are sloped in a way that gives you the effect that you're going uphill, but you are actually going downhill, even though your brain gives you the impression that you're going uphill. According to psychologists, it's all about the horizon. Either it's obscured in areas with gravity hills, so we don't have a proper point of reference, or the horizon is there, but it obscures how the hill slopes in relation to the rest of the landscape. Of course, not everyone accepts the scientific explanation, as if you are on a gravity hill, it's hard to believe. For example, there is a gravity hill in Lake Wales, Florida, known as Spooky Hill, where a sign is displayed that tells the story of a great battle between a giant alligator and a Native American chief. A lake was formed at the site by the ghost of one of them, which is said to be the cause of the gravity hill. Here, you are actually encouraged to try out the gravity-defying hill for yourself. Many of the gravity hills around the world have been utilized as tourist attractions, some with fanciful tales attached to them to attract more visitors. But in reality, they are just a confusion of the brain caused by Mother Nature herself. Seventeen Tiny Coffins in early July 1836, three Scottish boys were out searching for rabbit burrows in the rock formation near Edinburgh, known as Arthur's Seat. The boys came across some thin sheets of slate that appeared to have been placed over a rock alcove. When they removed the slate, it revealed 17 tiny coffins, each three or four inches long. There were two tiers of eight coffins each, and a third one with just one coffin. Not realizing their significance, the boys started hurling the tiny boxes at each other, damaging many of them. The next day, the surviving coffins were retrieved by the boys' schoolmaster, Mr. Ferguson, who was a member of a local archaeological society. At this point, the coffins were still unopened, so Mr. Ferguson took them home in a bag, and that evening, he settled down in his kitchen and began to prise the lids open with a knife. Each coffin contained a miniature wooden figure of human form cut out in wood. The faces in particular were fairly detailed. Some of the figures had missing arms, presumably because they didn't fit in the tiny coffin. They were dressed from head to toe in cotton clothes and laid out with all the trappings of a funeral. Their coffins were regularly shaped and cut out of a single piece of wood, with the exception of the lids, which were nailed down with wire sprigs or brass pins. It was thought the coffins had been placed individually in the little cave, and at intervals of many years. In the first year, the coffins were quite decayed, and the wrappings had moulded away. In the second year, the effects of age had not advanced so far, and the top coffin was quite recent looking. For nearly a hundred years, not much more was known about the origin or purpose of the strange miniature coffins, 
and fewer than half of them survived. Those that did eventually found their way into the collection of Robert Fraser, a jeweler who put them on display in his private museum. After Fraser's retirement in 1845, the collection was auctioned off and sold for just over four pounds. The coffins then passed into unknown private hands and remained there until 1901, when a set of eight, together with their contents, were donated to the National Museum of Scotland by their then owner, Christina Cooper. The mystery was what exactly the coffins were, who had placed them in their hiding place, and when. Several potential explanations were offered, the most popular being that the burials were part of some spell work, or that they represented mimic burials, perhaps for sailors lost at sea. The only comprehensive study of the coffins was carried out several years ago by Alan Simpson and Samuel Menfi, and they pointed out the most striking visual feature of the coffins is the use of applied pieces of tinned iron as decoration. Analysis of this metal suggests that it is very similar to the sort of tin used in shoe buckles, and opens up the possibility that the coffins were the work of a shoemaker or leather worker, who would have had the manual skills to make the coffins, but would have lacked the carpentry skills needed to make a neater job of it. Some disagree with this, and believe the coffins represent an event that happened at the time, perhaps the loss of a ship with 17 fatalities or some other tragedy. The most obvious being the Westport murders by William Burke and William Hare. Burke and Hare were responsible for 17 murders in Edinburgh during the late 1820s, and it would not be unreasonable for somebody in the absence of the 17 dissected bodies to wish to atone the dead, the majority of whom were murdered in atrocious circumstances, with a form of burial to let their spirits at rest. The most credible theory is that they were made by someone who knew Burke and Hare, and so had a strong motive to make amends for their crimes. Suggestions that Burke and Hare may be responsible for burying the coffins in an act of remorse seems unlikely, as both murderers were arrested almost immediately after committing their 17th killing, leaving little or no time for any burial to be made. A DNA sample for Burke has been obtained from the murderer's skeleton, which is preserved at Edinburgh University, but no traces of DNA could be recovered from the buried figurines. Another objection to this is that no fewer than 12 of Burke and Hare's victims were female, yet the clothed bodies found in the coffins appear to be dressed in male clothing. We think this is one mystery that will never be solved, but the story behind it is fascinating. Puska Castle in the Czech Republic. Just a short drive from Prague lies Huska Castle, a well-preserved 13th century building that has long been the subject of rumours regarding the purpose of its construction and the role it has played in one of the darkest chapters of human history. Thought to have been built under the orders of Ottokar II of Bohemia, who ruled from 1253 to 1278, Huska Castle is generally considered to be rather unusual. It held no strategic importance, it didn't contain any useful facilities, such as a kitchen. There are numerous fake windows, and its positioning didn't place it close to any trade routes. Whilst it has been suggested that the property may have been constructed solely as a base, from which Ottokar's numerous royal estates could be managed. Legends abound that the real function of the castle was to act as a barrier, as it was erected to cover a bottomless chasm in the earth, which had gained notoriety as the gateway to Hal. Myths tell us that prior to the castle sealing this gateway off from the wider community, winged demonic creatures crawled forth from it, dragging petrified locals into their doom. One particularly persistent tale is that of a convict offered freedom if he survived being lowered into this ravine leading to a hellish underworld. It is said that moments after the young man was dropped into the darkness, he screamed wildly to be winched back up. Upon reaching the surface once more, his features had aged and his hair had turned white. After spending a few days in an asylum, the man died 
presumably unable to recover from the shock of his ordeal. Throughout the ages, Huska Castle moved through the hands of various families and underwent numerous stages of decay and repair. In 1924, the Czech politician and industrial Josef Simonek purchased the building and under his ownership, the castle underwent a substantial renovation project and became his family's summer home. However, during World War II, the SS confiscated the castle and used it as a regional headquarters for their staff. Given the interest the Nazi party had displayed in the occult, some locals claimed the SS were attempting to utilize the gateway to Hal by channeling its dark power as a weapon for winning the war. In 1945, ownership of the castle reverted to the Simonek family, who further restored the building and opened it to the public in 1999. To this day, visitors claim to have heard screaming and scratching coming from the floors of the castle, and there have been sightings of strange creatures prowling the site. Allegedly, even the current owner has witnessed paranormal activity when hosting a party, a glass purportedly began to levitate, much to the horrified fascination of his guests. If you have ever happened to visit Huska Castle, we'd love to hear about your experience in the comments. Teotihuacan, Mexico. Less than 30 miles or 50 kilometers from the commotion of Mexico City lies a huge ancient Mesoamerican city whose origins and the purpose of some of the artifacts found there are shrouded in mystery. Predating the Aztec era by some thousand years, Teotihuacan is comprised of some 2,000 single-story dwellings, as well as vast pyramids, buildings of worship, and palaces, all of which cover an area 21 km square, or 8 square miles. Thought to have been home to up to 250,000 people during its epoch, the complex array of buildings filled with exquisite murals and icons of worship were constructed over four different periods, starting approximately 200 years BC and ending around 750 AD. Though historians have posited the theory that multiple ethnicities reside within the confines of Teotihuacan, as traces of cultural features pertaining to the Mayan, Zapotec, and Mixtec peoples have been found there, the original artifacts of this mega city remain unidentified. Little is also known about the language and personalities that ruled there, which furthers the sense of perplexity surrounding this site. Equally cryptic are some of the features found within Teotihuacan. In 2013, hundreds of pyrite-covered clay spheres were found in rooms beneath the Temple of the Feathered Serpent. These spheres, which would have once shone brightly, were hailed as an unprecedented discovery by archaeologists, though their meaning is still unknown, as too is the reason behind the ruin of Teotihuacan. Speculation as to why the inhabitants left are multifarious. Invasions from outsiders, internal civil unrest, natural disaster, and climate change are amongst the most likely theories. A place of worship and human sacrifice, home to a sophisticated civilization, Teotihuacan is still an enigma, despite the wealth of artifacts found there. It is perhaps best described by curator Matthew H. Robb, who declared that Teotihuacan both attracts and resists interpretation. Paul Bazin Set in the wilderness of Tuva, southern Siberia, and dominating an island within Lake Terracol, stands a ruin of a structure dated to the 8th century, the original purpose of which remains unknown. Poor Bazain, which means clay house, in the Tavinian language, was once a complex of some 30 buildings laid out over an area of 8 acres, covering almost all the permafrost island it stands upon. The structure's high outer walls first led to it being described as a fortress in 1701, when discovered by Simeon Ray Mezov, a geographer and cartographer who became famed for his mapping of the Siberian region. The Russian ethnographer, Dmitry Clements, during his visit in 1981, also theorized 
that poor Bazain was a fortress built during the reign of the Uyghur Empire, a tribal confederation who ruled over what is today China, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan. It wasn't until between 1953 and 1963 that significant, though limited, excavations took place, under the lead of archaeologist Sivan Weinstein. He concluded that the poor Bazain had been built for the Uyghur ruler Bayan Khan after his successful campaign against local tribesmen in 750 AD. However, in 2020, by use of carbon dating, the structure is now known to have been built in 777, nearly 20 years after Khan's death. Though artifacts have been discovered at the site, such as burnt wood, a dagger, silver jewellery, and a stone goblet, there is no sign that poor Bazain has been a site of any prolonged habitation. This is somewhat strange, given that signs of repair work, years after the building had been completed, have been discovered. The lack of permanent residence could perhaps be explained by its remote location or the political volatility of the area at the time. Further explanations of what the site may originally have been designed for have been pro-offered over the years, and it's been suggested that it could have been erected for ritual purposes, that it was also an astronomical observatory, or was indeed a Manichaean monastery, which was then forsaken after the abolishment of the Manichaean faith in the 9th century. These remain theories though, rather than fact. A concrete explanation of what poor Bazain, thought to have been destroyed by an earthquake and subsequently ravaged by several fires was meant to be, remains elusive. It's been described as one of the most mysterious archaeological monuments of Russia, and even prompted a confounded Vladimir Putin to exclaim upon his visit in 2007, that I have been to many places, I have seen many things, but I have never seen anything of the kind. It seems that the function of the remote and strange poor design may forever remain unexplained. Easter Island As you may remember, we've briefly discussed Easter Island before, but it's simply too fascinating to omit from the list. The isolated island, located 3,500 kilometers west, or 2,200 miles of Chile, is renowned for its impressive monolithic statues, known as Moai, of which there are nearly 1,000 spread over the land, created by Polynesian settlers. Their presence has long been a source of intrigue for explorers, historians, and modern-day visitors alike. The purpose of the statues, and how they were dispersed across Rapa Nui, given their weight and scale, has been pondered for years. Carbon dating places the statues as having been crafted between 1200 and 1650 AD, and it's generally thought that each statue represents a deceased inhabitant of Rapa Nui. Though it's also been suggested that the statues have been placed to indicate water sources, or to act as a source of protection for the island and its residents. Given that the average height of the figures is 13 feet or nearly 4 meters tall, and weigh 14 tons or 12,700 kilograms, it's easy to imagine that transporting them across the rugged landscape must have been a difficult task, lending a further sense of awe and mystery to this remote isle. Experts have claimed to have demystified some aspects of Rapa Nui. It has been proposed that the Moai could have been attached to a Y-shaped frame tied to the neck of the figure and dragged into place, a process that could require less than 200 men. Likewise, they could have been walked to their destination by means of men tugging at numerous ropes bound about the statue. Further intriguing aspects about the Rapa Nui, such as the reason for the downfall of its civilization, have been answered by an assortment of explanations, including ecological disaster, civil conflict, and the result of European contact, including slavery and the spreading of diseases, such as smallpox and TB, resulting in a huge demise of the native population in the 18th and 19th centuries. In 1722, when the Dutch explorer Jacob Roggeveen became the first European record first European recorded to set foot on Easter Island, the population was understood to have been between 2,000 and 3,000. By 1877, sadly this number had dwindled to 111. 
despite experts theorizing about the history and culture of this unique island. Due to there being no written history and only a small amount of oral history passed down to the generations, the meaning and purpose of the Moai and the exact history of the land, including its indigenous peoples, may never be completely known. Lake Michigan Triangle Much like the renowned Bermuda Triangle, there is an area of Lake Michigan extending from Manitowoc across to Lugginton and down south to Benton that appears to have a similarly mysterious force at work within it, with strange occurrences taking place there dating back to the late 17th century. The first instance of an unexplained disappearance in this region was that of the ship Le Griffin on her maiden voyage in 1679. The ship, owned by the French explorer and fur trader Robert Lasselle, set forth from Nicaragua County to explore Lakes Erie, Huron, and Michigan. These waters had previously only been navigated by canoe, and Lasselle, seeking to further his trading possibilities into China and Japan, intended to send Le Griffin in search of a northwest passage. In September 1679, the vessel reached an island close to Green Bay in Lake Michigan. Here, traders sent ahead by La Salle loaded the ship with a large quantity of furs. The ship, determined to explore more of Lake Michigan by canoe, ordered Le Griffin to travel to Mackinac Island in Lake Huron to offload their cargo and be collected upon their return voyage. But fate had other plans in store, and La Salle was never to see his ship ever again. The whereabouts of the shipwreck remain a mystery. But there have been other, equally perplexing incidents occurred within the Lake Michigan Triangle. In May 1891, the schooner, the Thomas Hume, vanished while sailing from Chicago to Muskegon to collect lumber. Despite a search, there was no sign of the ship, nor were any of its crew discovered, dead or alive. Though the owners offered a large reward for any information on their missing vessel, no one was able to assist. It wasn't until 2008 that a wreckage, almost completely intact and wonderfully preserved, was identified with near certainty as the Thomas Hume. What caused her to sink has still not been determined. Another schooner, the Rosabelle, was discovered capsized some 40 miles from Milwaukee in 1921. It had collected timber from Higher Island and was bound for Benton Harbor Though it had signs of a collision, no accidents had been reported and her crew were never found. But it's not just vessels that have disappeared in the Lake Michigan Triangle. In 1950, the biggest loss of life in a commercial air travel in America at the time occurred within the Lake Michigan Triangle. It was June 23rd when the Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 2501 had flown from New York and was heading for its first stopover location, Minneapolis, en route to its final destination of Seattle. There were reports of storms over Lake Michigan, and the flight had already descended due to the approaching weather front. A further request from the pilot to descend to 2,500 feet was declined by air traffic control, and it was at this point that they lost contact with the plane. It was 18 miles northwest of Benton Harbor, a search was launched when it became apparent that the plane, which had 58 people on board, had crashed into the lake. Though debris and some body parts were discovered, the remnants of Flight 2501 still lay undiscovered, despite an annual search for it, which has taken place since 2004. Phenomena such as large blocks of ice falling from the sky and earth-shaking fireballs have also been reported within the Lake Michigan Triangle adding further fuel to the notion that this is an area that has seen a high level of unusual and sometimes unexplained activity. Rose Hip Neurons In 2018, an exciting new announcement was made about a previously undiscovered cell in the human brain. The new cell was renamed the Rose Hip Neuron because of its likeness in shape to the fruit of rose bushes. The discovery of these new brain cells was first noticed a few years previous in two separate labs, one in Hungary and one in Seattle. And when they realized they were both investigating the same neuron, they decided to collaborate on a study. Using two brains donated to science from deceased men in their mid-50s, 
the labs used various techniques to study the neurons. The Hungarian team examined the neurons' shape and electrical properties, while the Seattle team looked at the genetics. They found that these new neurons are different from other neurons. They are very dense, and the dendrites are very compact, with lots of branch points. Interestingly, this type of neuron only exists in humans, which probably explains why it took so long to discover them. As usually, animals, in particular rodents, are used in neuroscience studies. The existence of the rosehip neuron may explain why so many treatments for brain disorders seem to work in mouse models, but fail to be effective when applied to humans. Meaning these newly discovered neurons may hold the key to understanding complex psychiatric disorders in humans that do not exist in animals. Although for now, what the rosehip neuron does is not entirely clear. What we do know is that the cells make up about 10% of the neocortex, which was the last part of the brain to evolve and is associated with sight and hearing. It also appears to be an inhibitory neuron, meaning it regulates the flow of information to certain parts of the brain. It's hoped that further studies on brain samples from people suffering from neuropsychiatric disorders will show that they have altered rosehip neurons. If this is the case, it may be possible to develop a targeted therapy to help those suffering. But for now, just like all the other mysterious parts of the brain we'll cover, their true function and significance is not known. Endorestiform nucleus. Now this next one is another exciting new discovery. Similar to rosehip neurons, again it was not detected during animal experimentation and appears to be unique to the human brain. It's called endorestiform nucleus and is a nucleus present within the inferior cerebellar panuncle of human brains. It was discovered by George Paxinos and his team at Neuroscience Research Australia. George had long suspected the existence of the endorestiform nucleus, however it was not until 2018 that he was able to confirm its presence due to advances in staining and imaging techniques. The nucleus is located at the base of the brain, near where the brain meets the spinal cord. This area is involved in receiving sensory and motor information to refine our posture, balance and movements. George explained that the inferior cerebellar panuncle is like a river carrying information from the spinal cord and brainstem to the cerebellum and the endorestiform nucleus is a group of neurons and is like an island in this river. He also said it was too early to know its true significance. Although it's possible the endorestiform nucleus has been hiding in plain sight for years. In a procedure called a therapeutic antilateral chordotomy, a surgery to achieve relief from extreme and incurable pain by cutting spinal pathways. George and his colleagues had noticed that the long fibers from the spine seemed to end around where the endorestiform nucleus was found. And the location of this elusive brain bit leads George to suspect it may be involved in fine motor control. His theory is backed up by the fact that this structure has yet to be identified in test animals such as marmosets or monkeys, and may explain why humans have the dexterity to play instruments and perform intricate operations, whereas chimpanzees do not, indicating the end restiform nucleus may be another unique feature in a human's nervous system. In order to discover what function the endorestiform nucleus might serve, we may have to wait for higher resolution MRIs capable of studying it in a living person. Comparing the normal brain studies for the atlas with those from people with known abnormalities might also lead to some insights. At the moment, it's impossible to know what implications this discovery of endorestiform nucleus have for neurological or psychiatric disease in the future, but investigations into the functionality of this nucleus in the coming years will be key in answering these questions. The posterior cingulate cortex. This part of the brain is one of the least well understood regions of the cortex. The posterior cingulate cortex, or PCC for short, is known as the dark energy of the brain as it consumes more calories than any other part of the brain, indicating it works very hard. However, no one is quite sure what it does. Even trying to study PCC is challenging because it does not function well as a test subject. 
For example, if you put a person into a brain scanner and ask them to do a task, any task, the PCC turns off. That is, its neurons stop firing. Then, during the delay between tasks, it turns on again, only to turn off again when the task restarts. It is also a part of the brain that is rarely targeted by diseases, like strokes, that create lesions, so it's hard to guess what happens when a PCC is compromised or damaged. It is, however, thought PCC is linked to emotions, memory, consciousness, attentional control, planning, and retrospection, although others have suggested that it governs mind-wandering or daydreaming, meaning it becomes active and consumes large amounts of energy when we are awake, but not really focused on anything in particular. However, it has shown abnormalities in connection with Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, and depression, which may suggest it plays a vital role in focusing attention and arousal. But all these are just theories, and in reality, neuroscientists cannot conclusively say what this elusive energy-consuming part of our brain is really there for. The Mystery of Memories Our brain is like a computer's hard drive. It continually records information and stores it. And that is what forms our memories. So, whether it's the first time you saw your mother's face, your favorite holiday, or the time you realize you've fallen in love, it is all safely stored somewhere inside that incredible lump of jelly in your skull. And what is remarkable about our memories is it's not just a single snapshot, it's everything that goes with it, such as smells, colors, the way you felt, or even the weather on that particular day. However, neuroscientists have no idea how our brains do this, nor do they know how this information gets stored in the brain. There isn't just one kind of memory, we have both short-term and long-term memory, as well as declarative memories, responsible for names and facts, non-declarative memory, responsible for so-called muscle memory or flashbulb memories, when we can recall precise details of an event. And the brain has the ability to recognize and categorize the importance of some of these memories. For example, the more some information is repeated or used, the more likely it is to be retained in long-term memory which is why the more studying you do, the better you generally do in tests. Neuroscientists think that where these memories are stored depends on the original experience. For instance, groups of neurons in the visual cortex store the visual memory, whereas neurons in the amygdala store the associated emotion. It's also believed that no memory is ever wiped out completely. It will be in the brain somewhere, Although retrieving it, especially after an illness, brain injury, or the lapse of time, is sometimes impossible. It is impressive that neuroscientists have been able to tell us all about memories. However, there is still a lot they aren't sure about. Like how memories form, why certain memories degrade and fade, why we sometimes develop fake memories, and why we cannot always recall information when we need it. And like so many other mysteries of the brain, it could be some years before we fully understand how we make and keep memories. Human Consciousness What is consciousness? Is it located in the brain? Is it a physical thing? Is it unique to humans? Or could every physical thing have a conscience? Or is there some other explanation for it? While well, despite these appearing to be relatively straightforward questions, it seems that even the most brilliant scientists in the world are no nearer to answering any of them, and human consciousness still remains a mystery. It does seem hard to believe that a three pound lump of jelly-like moist pinkish beige tissue inside our skulls can possibly be responsible for our awareness. Thought process, feelings, and memories, all individually tailored to every single human being that has ever existed, but without any other explanation, that is what many believe. Of course, that wasn't always the case. Early Christian philosophers believed the soul of a human was created by God and infused into the body at conception, and that it lived on even after the physical body dies and the soul of a person was responsible for all the things we now recognize as consciousness. However, scientists have long dismissed this argument and over the years, they have learned an astonishing amount about our brains and are able to pinpoint which regions of the brain are associated with most things, that is, apart from consciousness. 
So is it possible consciousness is not a physical thing? It is not controlled by our brains and does not reside in our bodies. Well, if this is the case, then it opens up the possibility that every living and non-living thing has a conscience of some degree that is unique to them. For instance, if we believe our pets have consciousness, albeit a bit different to humans, in principle, that could mean that trees, plants, the internet, a smartphone, or even a TV could also have a form of consciousness unique to them. In fact, everything in the universe might be conscious, or at least potentially conscious, or conscious when put into certain configurations. The thing is, we do not know because it cannot be observed except from within by the conscious person or thing. It cannot even really be described and only the person or thing knows what it feels like to them. At any given moment, no matter how well you know someone, you haven't got a clue if their inner consciousness is the same as yours. So, could consciousness somehow be something extra, an additional ingredient in nature, unique to everything and everyone, that has nothing to do with ordinary physical atoms? Could scientists in the future create robots that are so human-like, you wouldn't be able to tell whether they were human or not, unless they were put through a scanner? But just because they have no physical human organs, does that also mean they would have no consciousness? Or would they have their own unique consciousness? So should we concede without any evidence that consciousness is just the physical brain doing what brains do, and eventually neuroscience will prove this? Well, at the moment, the closest thing they have got to proving this is when a team of researchers designed a device that stimulates the brain with electrical voltage to measure how integrated its neural circuits are. The device was tested on a variety of subjects and revealed when people fall into a deep sleep or are anaesthetized as they slip into unconsciousness. The device demonstrates that their brain integration declines. And amongst patients suffering from locked-in syndrome, who are as conscious as the rest of us, levels of brain integration remain high, but among patients who are in coma, it doesn't. These tests seem to indicate the brain is in part responsible for consciousness. However, this theory is again thrown into doubt with near-death experiences. When people repeatedly claim during near-death experiences, they recall leaving their physical bodies, but are still able to recall details of hospital staff, relatives, and medical procedures, implying that consciousness may not always reside within the body. The Floating Eye Island in 2016, producer and director Sergio Nuspilla and his team were searching for a location to film a documentary. As they scanned Google Maps, their attention was grabbed by a strange circular formation situated in the Parana Delta Marshes in northeast Argentina. The circle of land is 118 meters in diameter, surrounded by a thin water channel. The two circles formed by the water and the land are so perfect that it's hard to believe that the island is a natural phenomena. What's even stranger is when Sergio studied the island in more detail by using the time control function on Google Earth. He discovered that the inner land disk appears to be moving and turning on its own axis. Intrigued by what he found, Sergio decided to go directly to the area to observe this strange phenomena with his own eyes and to try and find a rational explanation. Accompanying him on the expedition was two specialists, Richard Detroni, a hydraulic and civil engineer from New York, and Pablo Martinez, a tech expert. However, when they reached the site, the mystery intensified. They found the area incredible and extremely strange, and they discovered that the water surrounding the disk is very clear and cold, which is unheard of in this area. The group of explorers completed a summary report of the island's physical characteristics, stating the base is hard in comparison with the swamps that surround it, and they could see no obvious explanation for why it floats. It appeared to be perfectly circular and moved almost magically around an axis. These unusual characteristics led to it being nicknamed the Eye. After he was unable to get to the bottom of what the Eye was, Sergio launched a campaign on Kickstarter to try and raise funds for a secondary expedition. On the secondary expedition, he planned to recruit a multidisciplinary team, invest in diving equipment, specialist drones, and plan to collect and analyze samples from the site. Although it seemed this never materialized, 
and as such, the eye remains a mystery. Since then, many have speculated that it's some sort of portal to another realm, whilst others have a far more rational explanation, and claim that the phenomena is not necessarily unique for that area, where similar formations have been witnessed. Until we have a definitive answer, you can make up your own mind by searching on Google Maps using the following coordinates. Let us know what you think. Marfa Ghost Lights Halloween has been and gone, but that by no means that it's an end to creepy content, especially ghosts, so let's talk about the Marfa Lights, also known as the Marfa Ghost Lights, which are an unknown rare phenomena that have been observed near US Route 67 on Mitchell Flat, just east of Marfa, Texas. The mysterious glowing orbs have mystified people for generations. According to those who have witnessed them, the lights appear to be roughly the size of basketballs and are described as glowing white, blue, yellow, red, or other colors. The twinkling lights act erratic, sometimes merging together, other times splitting into two and floating up in the air or darting off quickly across Mitchell Flat. There seems to be no way to predict when the lights will appear. Now they've been seen in various weather conditions as well, but only seem to show up a dozen or so nights a year. For the longest time, the Native Americans of the area thought the Marfa lights were fallen stars. They were first mentioned outside the native community in 1883, when cowhand Robert Reed Ellison claimed to have seen flickering lights one evening while driving a herd of cattle near Mitchell Flat. He assumed the lights were from the Apache campfires, but when he asked the locals, they told him that they often saw the lights too. After an investigation, they found no ashes or other evidence of campfires. During the Second World War, pilots from the nearby Midland Army Airfield tried to locate the source of the mysterious lights, but were unable to discover anything. As you would expect, paranormal theorists have attributed the Marfa lights to everything from space aliens to the wandering ghosts of Spanish conquistadors. Academics have also tried to offer a scientific explanation for the mysterious lights, and some have concluded that headlights from vehicles on the nearby highway could explain at least some of the reported sightings, but not all of them. Another chain of thought is that they are a refraction of light caused by layers of air at different temperatures, creating an optical illusion, sometimes called a superior mirage or a fata morgana. A similar illusion is sometimes seen in the ocean, causing a ship to appear to float above the horizon. Others speculate the phenomena may be caused by the same gases that create the glowing lights known as will o the wisp a phenomenon found around the world that is associated with swamp gases, mainly phosphine and methane, which under certain conditions can ignite when they contact oxygen. Although it is worth pointing out that the Marfa lights are nowhere near a marsh, however, there are significant reserves of oil, natural gas, and other petroleum hydrocarbons in the area, which could include methane in quantities capable of producing a similar effect. Another suggestion is that the lights are the result of the igneous rock under Mitchell Flat that creates an electric charge produced under pressure by solid matter such as minerals, crystals, or ceramics. This is called a piezoelectric charge. However, despite these many theories, nothing has ever been proven, and if you were driving alone along Route 67 near Marfa, you'd be pretty freaked out if you saw the Marfa ghost lights dancing around in front of you, because to this day, they have not been conclusively explained. Mount Horaima. Now this is an interesting one. Mount Horaima is a plateaued mountain about 1,300 feet high, located at the point that Brazil, Venezuela, and Guyana converge, and is the highest of the Pacaraima chain of tabletop mountains in South America. Long before the arrival of European explorers and gold hunters, the mountain held a special significance to the indigenous people of the region, and it's central to many of their myths and legends. They viewed the mountain as the tree that bore all the fruits and crops of the world, until it was cruelly hacked down by one of their ancestors, unleashing a terrible flood. According to the myth, Mount Horaima is the remaining trunk left after the flood. They also believed anyone who climbed to the top of the tabletop would not come back alive. 
To this day, the indigenous people living near Mount Horaima give reference to this great mountain and its history, and its unique structure and remote location, combined with the mysterious air of untouched territory and indigenous folklore, has created grounds for various unexplained theories. Despite the mountain being climbed from all sides on numerous occasions, the area has not been extensively explored, and many believe its remoteness and lack of investigation could mean some species considered to be long extinct may actually still be alive and well on Mount Horaima. This may sound hard to believe, but this theory is backed up by flora and fauna found on the mountain that is unique and includes pitcher plants, bellflowers, and rapid sea heather. The enigma of Mount Horaima has drawn the attention of not only the prospectors and climbers, but also famous authors intrigued by its untouched swaths of land. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and his 1912 novel The Lost World described Mount Horaima with the characters in the story discovering extinct creatures were still living there. More recently, the Paradise Falls featured in the Pixar movie is thought to have been inspired by the dramatic waterfalls around the area. The indigenous people of the area are not the only ones who believe in the power and mystery of Mount Horaima. In addition to the intriguing plant life and legends, it is also known for its high frequency of UFO sightings. Witnesses have reported seeing strange swirling lights hovering above or between Mount Horaima and Kukanam, another nearby Teipui, or tabletop, and the whole region is considered a UFO hotspot. Another odd phenomena has been reported from those who have managed to scale the mountain. They claim to have felt as if they are in an altered state, with some experiencing a trance-like mindset followed by a bizarre dream involving aliens. Some have even likened the energy of Mount Horaima to that of Stonehenge or the Bermuda Triangle. Even some skeptics seem to be convinced of the power of Mount Horaima after exploring it. What an incredible mountain, and one that certainly doesn't get the recognition or coverage it deserves. Nevada's Magnificent Fly Geyser not such a mystery this one, but rather an accidental man-made geological wonder. This alien looking formation, known as Fly Geyser, is located near the edge of Fly Reservoir on the Wallapai Geothermal Flats, just north of Gerlach in Nevada, USA. It's not the first geyser to form in the area, but it is the most extraordinary. The first geyser at the site was formed in 1916, when a well was drilled seeking irrigation water. However, when the geothermal water was found to be close to boiling point, the well was abandoned. However, the opening formed a 10 to 12 foot, or 3 to 3.7 meter calcium carbonate cone that jetted above the landscape. The geyser remained there until 1964, when a geothermal energy company drilled a second well near the site of the first one. However, on this occasion, the water was not hot enough for energy purposes, so they capped the well and left it. However, the seal failed, and the discharge released sufficient pressure to cause the original geyser to dry up, and another cone to develop at the second site. The dissolved minerals in the escaping water accumulated around the new geyser, creating the cones and travertine pools that can be seen today. The geyser now has various conic openings sitting at a mound that is 25 to 30 feet, or 7.6 to 9.1 meters tall. The temperature and chemical composition of the mineral-laden water spewing from the cone is unique, and the water can exceed 200 degrees Fahrenheit or 93 degrees Celsius. It contains an extremely high volume of silica, and the silica combined with the heat has caused quartz to form inside the geyser. It's worth noting that quartz typically take up to 10,000 years to develop in geysers, but these have been developed incredibly quickly, unlike any other in the world. The water is released continuously, sometimes reaching 5 feet or 1.5 meters in the air, and has formed several travertine terraces, creating 30 to 40 pools over an area of 74 acres. The water produced by the geyser contains thermophilic algae, which flourish in moist, hot environments, and is responsible for coloring the rocks with brilliant hues of green and red. Since 1964, Two additional geysers have been created in the area and continue to grow, but neither are yet as spectacular as the fly geyser. 
If you live in the area, this is definitely worth the travel. The Lost City of Cahokia. The Cahokia Mounds are all that is left of a pre-Columbian Native American city, which existed between 1050 and 1350 CE. The historic site lies in southwestern Illinois, between East St. Louis and Collinsville, and covers 2,200 acres, containing about 80 mounds. Long before Columbus reached the Americas, Cahokia was the biggest, most cosmopolitan city north of Mexico. Yet by 1350, it had been entirely deserted by its native inhabitants, and no one really knows why. In its prime, about four centuries before Columbus stumbled onto the Western Hemisphere, Cahokia was a prosperous pre-American city, with a population similar to London's. But rather than developing like London into a modern metropolis, Cahokia is more like the fabled lost continent of Atlantis. It was built by the Mississippians, a group of Native Americans who at the time occupied much of the present-day southeastern United States. The Mississippians farmed, traded, and hunted, and it appears they built and planned the Cahokia to double as a pilgrimage city, where all of them would gather for religious events. We know that the land was prone to flooding, so all the key buildings were set atop vast, hand-built earthen mounds the largest of which was found to be 100 feet tall and covered 14 acres that still exist today. This one is known as Monk's Mound. Monk's Mound was the site of a sizable building believed to have been used as a political, spiritual meeting place. Just west of Monk's Mound, a circle of tall posts used the position of the rising sun to mark the summer and winter solstices and the spring and fall equinoxes. In 1961, the posts were re-erected and dubbed Woodhenge by archaeologists who began researching the area, in reference to Stonehenge in England. The mound building would have been back-breaking work, with the Mississippians digging up, hauling, and stacking 55 million cubic feet over the course of a few decades, using no more than woven baskets to transport the earth. When you think about it, this is a feat likened to the building of the Egyptian pyramids, yet very few talk about it. Excavations of the area since the 60s have produced fascinating information about the ancient city. Investigators have found artistic stone and ceramic figurines, as well as a small copper workshop adjacent to the base of one of the mounds. Inside they found a fireplace with coals, where copper could be pounded out and tempered, before being made into ornate objects. Archaeologists also discovered a mound containing mass burials, and the nature of the injuries to the remains indicated that the Mississippians may have conducted ritual human sacrifices. Hundreds of people, mostly young women, buried in these mass graves were either strangled or died of bloodletting. Of the men found, four had their heads and hands cut off, and in another burial pit that mostly contained males, they had been clubbed to death. There is no evidence that the city was besieged by warfare or invasion from outsiders, but what is obvious is something catastrophic drove the settlers out. Although the story of Cahokia's decline and eventual end is a mystery. Tales of Cahokia don't even appear in Native American folklore, which is unusual, and it seems that whatever happened there doesn't bear talking about. Despite it being one of the 24 UNESCO World Heritage Sites within the United States, many people still do not know about it. The Bunyip. The Bunyip is a legendary monster in Australian Aboriginal folklore. The beast is said to inhibit the reedy swamps, billabongs, creeks, and riverbeds of Australia. The word Bunyip translates to devil or evil spirit. However, its name and description vary according to tribal diction. And in a 2001 book written by Robert Holden, he identified at least nine regional variations of the creature. But it wasn't just the Aboriginal people who had stories of bunyips. European settlers in the early and mid-19th century also recorded accounts of the mythical creature, mainly in southeastern colonies of Victoria, New South Wales, and South Australia. So what is the bunyip? While the most common description is it resembles a seal or swimming dog between four and six feet long, with a shaggy black or brown coat, 
a round head resembling a bulldog, prominent ears, no tail, and whiskers like a seal or otter. Others describe it as a long-necked creature with a small head between 5 and 15 feet long, with black or brown fur, large eyes, short tusks, with a head like a horse or an emu. The first written description of the amphibious creature came in 1845, when it was described as having a round head, an elongated neck, and a body resembling that of an ox, hippopotamus, or manatee, with smooth skin and orange eyes. It has even been suggested that the bunny ip is the prehistoric marsupial Diprotrodon australis, which was supposed to have gone extinct 46,000 years ago. Aborigines have differing opinions on the bunny ip's motives, and while many believe it's a bloodthirsty murderer with supernatural powers that can alter the water level, cripple victims with its roar, and hypnotize humans to act as its slave, others believe the bunny ip is a punisher sent to earth to protect wildlife and bring justice to anyone who commits evil acts. In reality, no one really knows what the creature looks like, or whether it actually exists, but that hasn't stopped people giving vivid stories of their encounters with the monster. In 1851, a newspaper called The Australasian published a report about a bunyip being spared after killing an Aboriginal man. The monster was described as 11 paces long and 4 paces wide. Fossils have also been uncovered that have been associated with the bunyip. In January of 1846, a skull was found in the Murrumbidgee River near Balronald. It was placed in the Australian Museum in Sydney and labelled as a bunyip skull. Visitors flocked to see it, and it provoked a wave of people speaking out about their bunyip sightings. However, it was later proved to be the skull of a disfigured calf. But probably the most detailed account was in 1845, when Geelong Advertiser reported the story of an Aboriginal woman being killed by a bunyip, and a man named Mum Boran suffering several deep wounds on his breast, made by the claws of the creature. The account provided this description. The bunyip is represented as uniting the characteristics of a bird and of an alligator. It has a head resembling an emu, with a long bill at the extremity, of which is a transverse projection on each side with serrated edges like the bone of the stingray. Its body and legs partake of the nature of the alligator. The hind legs are remarkably thick and strong, and the forelegs are much longer, but still of great strength. The extremities are furnished with long claws, and its usual method of killing its prey is by hugging it to death. When in the water, it swims like a frog, and when on the shore, it walks on its hind legs with its head erect in which position it measures 12 or 13 feet in height. If we are honest, there are so many different descriptions of the bunyip that it's hard to believe sightings of it are anything other than wild imaginations or mistaken identity of unknown creatures. Although it seems the bunyip myth has been very much kept alive over the years, and has appeared in various forms in books, games and films. The most recent being in 2019, when the bunyip is amongst the titans, monitored by Monarch, in the film Godzilla, King of the Monsters. The Yakumama. Out of all the creatures featured in this list, the Yakumama is the most likely to actually exist. Yakumama means mother of water and refers to an enormous serpent believed to live in the Peruvian Amazon rainforest. The Yakumama is described by the indigenous peoples as being a huge snake that grows up to 50 feet or 15 meters in length with a head six feet wide, or two meters, that catches its prey by spitting out and flooring it like a water cannon. The Yakumama's enormous body is capable of felling trees in its path and changing the course of the tributaries of small rivers when crossed. According to legend, the Yukumama will suck up any living thing that passes within 100 steps of it. So to protect themselves, before stepping into the water, the locals blow on a conch horn in the hope that the Yukamama will reveal itself before they enter. However, what is believed they have witnessed is either a giant anaconda or a giant Sicilian, a limbless, serpentine amphibian that lives hidden in the ground or bodies of water. A similar monster known as the Minhokao or the Sachamama features in Brazilian folklore. It is also described as a large fish or worm measuring 20 to 50 meters 
and they tell a similar tale of the creature altering the earth as it passes through. It's believed that these three creatures are one in the same and are all the species of an unknown giant reptile. This theory was backed up in 1906 when the famous explorer Percy H. Fawcett claimed to have ground a giant anaconda while traveling through the Amazon River. He allegedly shot the creature dead. This is his account of what happened. I walked ashore and approached the reptile with caution. I was immobile, but shivers kept running up and down the body like puffs of wind on a hill mountain, as was be measured, length 14 meters out of the water and lay five meters at her, making a total length of 19 meters. So large specimens as this may not be common, but the trails in the swamps reach a width of two meters and support the statements of Indians and rubber pickers that the anaconda sometimes reaches an incredible size, completely eclipsing the shot for me. Brazilian Borders Commission told me of one killed in the Paraguay River more than 24 meters long. However, many were still not convinced, and 100 years later, in 2009, two brothers, Mike and Greg Warner, mounted an expedition into the jungle of the Peruvian Amazon to look for evidence of the monstrous snake. The expedition was inconclusive, although they did record trails of what they believed were giant snakes. They also took testimonies of natives who claimed to have seen the Yukamama. They all described the same thing, an enormous snake that takes water with it. Although the first expedition could not find the elusive Yukamama, the brothers were undeterred and mounted another expedition. During the second expedition, they succeeded in finding and photographing areas where Yukamama allegedly lives and filming their trenches, some that were almost two meters wide. Over the years, some sightings have included descriptions of a Yukamama snake with horns sprouting from its head. This peculiar feature has led some to believe that Yukamama could be a prehistoric version of a Sicilian. Most of the roughly 50 species of Sicilians have a groove along both sides of the head, containing retractable tentacles. One thing is for sure, all the sightings of these giant snakes have similar descriptions, and the Warner Brothers believe that the snakes that the Brazilians call the Sachamama are the same as the Peruvian Yucamama snakes. Snakes that have grown so large that they have become virtually immobile and have adopted to a different way of catching their prey. So it's entirely possible that Yucamama, Sachamama, and the Minocau are either a giant anaconda or an unknown giant species of Sicilian. What do you think? The Ogopogo. You have probably all heard of the Loch Ness Monster, the huge serpent creature that supposedly lurks in the depths of the Loch Ness in Scotland, UK. We've talked about it multiple times. While Canada has its own version of Nessie, known as the Ogopogo, that lives in the depths of the Okanagan Lake near the city of Kelowna in British Columbia. The Ogopogo has been described as a multi-humped serpentine beast with green or black skin and a head of a horse, snake or sheep. And similar to the towns and villages around Loch Ness, the area takes pride in the legend of Ogopogo and can be found in various guises in the souvenir shops around Kelowna Ogopogo mania peaked in the 1980s when the region's tourism association offered a $1 million reward for proof of the creature's existence. Over the years, there have been various sightings of the creature, many making the local headlines, with witnesses all describing a similar thing, saying they spotted the creature meandering through the 84 mile long lake, creating huge, undulating waves as it moved. In fact, Ogopogo is so accepted in Canadian culture that 16% of British Columbians believe it exists. However, the Okanagan Valley's indigenous believe the Ogopogo was not a physical creature, but a spirit that protects the lake and the surrounding area. And they call it Ohaha et Ku, which means the sacred spirit of the lake, and originally it existed in two forms, a spiritual form and a physical. Sometimes the spirit would reveal its physical self from within the lake. The Enhaha Eku was described as very dark in color with the head of a horse and the antlers of a deer. But when settlers arrived, this tale was misinterpreted and they were soon telling stories of a serpent in Okanagan Lake that needed a live animal sacrifice to appease it and ensure a safe passage across the water. The idea of a bloodthirsty lake serpent took hold and grew out of control and settlers began patrolling the lake with guns, convinced the monster was going to attack. 
This is when the Enhahaid Ku transformed from a revered spirit into a monster known as Ogopogo. And as time went on, stories grew, and soon everyone was seeing the killer creature in the lake. Today, Ogopogo is intrinsically linked with Kilona, and similar to Nessie, the legend is as popular as ever. Understandably, the locals are hesitant to want to disprove its existence, as it's good for tourism and has become a Canadian cultural icon. Cetus In ancient Greek, Cetus is a sea monster who was visualized as an enormous coiling sea serpent with a gaping jaw, the feet of a land animal attached to a solid scaly body. One of the stories behind the monster is mentioned in the story of Perseus, a Greek hero and slayer of monsters, before the days of Hercules. It all happened when Queen of Ethiopia boasted that her daughter, Andromeda, was more beautiful than the nymphs. The god of the sea, Poseidon, was furious at this claim and sent a sea monster named Cetus to destroy the shores of the region. The queen was frightened and her husband asked the advice of an oracle who told them that they should sacrifice their daughter to the monster in order to appease the god. The royal couple agreed and had their daughter chained to a rock next to the sea. As Andromeda screamed and watched helplessly as the monster approached her, Perseus happened to pass by and swooped down like an eagle onto the creature's back, diving his diamond hard sword deep into its right shoulder. Anguished and enraged, the wounded monster reared up on its coils and turned around, snapping relentlessly at its attacker. Repeatedly, Perseus plunged his sword into the beast through its ribs, its back, and at the root of its tail. Blood poured from the wounded creature before it finally collapsed. Its corpse was hauled to shore by the appreciative locals who skinned the beast and put its bones on display. Since then, the monster of the sea is represented by the constellation Cetus. Cetus is the fourth largest constellation, although none of its stars are particularly bright. The most celebrated star in the constellation is Mira, a Latin name meaning the Amazing One, on account of its variability in brightness. At times, Miria is the only star that can be seen with the naked eye. So to see this monster, you do not look into the water anymore, you look towards the sky, preferably with a telescope if you want to see its full form. Although of course, it looks more like a child's drawing than a ferocious monster described in the story. The Kappa In the waters of Japan, there lurks a creature that is as mysterious as it's terrifying. It's known as the Kappa. This strange creature is said to hold magical powers that can be used for both good and evil. And despite many refusing to believe in the existence of the Kappa, there are still sightings today, especially in the countryside of Japan. In fact, locals still hang warning signs near bodies of water thought to be frequented by the Kappa. So what is it? This strange creature is said to have the appearance of both a humanoid and reptile and is incredibly cunning. Kappas have over 80 different names, though the most common are Kawapa and Kawaso. According to legend, the Kappa is fond of playing pranks and causing trouble and even harm towards humans. Their pranks can vary from harmless jokes like making noises similar to flatulence or looking up a woman's kimono, to more violent acts like trying to drown livestock, kidnapping and eating children, or forcing themselves upon women. Although Kappa are generally considered a force to be feared, there are some instances in which the Kappa are thought to be generous, though this mostly happens when a Kappa is indebted to a human. Some of the earliest accounts of this are from early Japanese legends that credit the Kappa with teaching them knowledge of bone setting and medical remedies. Descriptions of Kappa vary from region to region, but most of the details are similar. Kappa are said to be about the size of a small child up to five feet tall with small frames. In fact, the word Kappa actually translates loosely to water child. Their hands and feet are webs and they have amazing swimming abilities. They have scaly skin similar to that of a reptile that comes in colours of yellow, green and blue. They are said to have a humanoid figure with the shell of a tortoise on their back and long shaggy hair on their head, usually shaped in a bowl cut. They also have a beak for a mouth, though this doesn't seem to interfere with their ability to speak in human languages. All Kappas have a small bowl-like dent on top of their heads that holds a small pool of water called the Sara. This water is thought to be the source of the Kappa's magical powers. A 
Kappa must keep their Sara full whenever they venture onto land or fortify all their strength and magical powers. Without this water, a Kappa will die. However, it's thought that if you refill the Sara on a Kappa's head, they will be eternally grateful and will help you with whatever you will require for the rest of your life. According to legend, Kappas are obsessed with an object called Shiri Godama, a mysterious jewel thought to contain a person's life force that is located in the human bottom, and is thought that the majority of violent attacks by Kappa are made to obtain this. However, despite their evil ways, Kappa are obsessed with politeness and human tradition, and this is considered to be its biggest weakness. Many who tell of a Kappa encounter in which they escaped claim that they were able to do so because they made the Kappa spill the water in its Sara when they bowed. However, in some places, the cunning Kappa have caught onto this practice and use a metal plate to protect their Sara when they come ashore. There are also several accounts of people being able to ward off Kappa by carrying iron, sesame, or ginger. Now, all this sounds far-fetched, of course, and it's believed the legend of the Kappa is simply a story for children to scare them from venturing too closely to the water without their parents. However, there are those that believe the Kappa could be a type of alien creature that somehow found its way to Earth, and that they also inhabit the oceans of the world. These strange sea aliens are able to travel to and from Earth through portals, which may explain why we've never been able to prove their existence. Of course, most of this is fun and games, but what do you think? The most plausible theory is that the Kappa is in fact a Japanese giant salamander, these salamanders grow to be about 5 feet in length and have skin tone similar to that of the kappa. They are also known for grabbing their prey with their strong jaws and pulling them into the water. Coincidentally, Japanese giant salamanders are also known to inhabit the rivers, lakes and ponds, where sightings of kappas have been reported. What's your thoughts? North Korea Hotel of Doom The Friogon Hotel in Pyongyang is the tallest unoccupied building in the world. Standing at 1,080 feet, its pyramid-shaped design dominates the skyline. However, despite boasting 105 floors, it's never welcomed a single guest. The hotel was the product of the Cold War rivalry between North and South Korea. In 1986, a South Korean company built the West in Stamford in Singapore, at the time the tallest hotel in the world. In response, North Korea planned to steal their record by building an ever higher hotel. Construction on the state of the art hotel began in 1987. It was designed to house at least 3,000 rooms, as well as five revolving restaurants with panoramic views. It was scheduled to open in 1992, in time for the 80th birthday of President Kim Il-sung. By 1992, the building had reached its full architectural height but due to engineering problems and the economic crisis in North Korea, following the collapse of the Soviet Union, construction stopped, and the half-finished building that cost an estimated $75 million was abandoned. Ironically, had it reopened on time, it would have surpassed the West in Stamford to become the world's tallest hotel and would have been the seventh tallest building in the world. For over a decade, the skeleton of the concrete structure loomed large over the city at the top, there was a rusting crane serving as an eerie reminder of the broken dream. Rumours started circulating that the building was shoddily built, and that the alignment of its elevator shafts were crooked, and it soon got dubbed the worst building in the world, with the names such as the Hotel of Doom and the Phantom Hotel. To the North Korean government, the building became an embarrassment, and the hotel's vision they once proudly displayed on postage stamps was now edited out of official photographs and omitted from printed maps. Then in 2008, after a 16-year pause, construction unexpectedly resumed as part of a deal with Oriscom, an Egyptian conglomerate that was contracted to build North Korea's 3G network. The rusty old crane that blotted the landscape for nearly two decades was finally removed, and the structure was reinforced with metal panels. The building was completely glazed over with windows, giving it a modern, sleek appearance. The project was completed in 2011, and it was speculated the hotel's opening was imminent, although photographs of the hotel's interior revealed that inside very little work had been done. German luxury hotel group Kempinski announced that the hotel would partially open under its management in mid-2013, but just a few months later, 
they pulled out, saying entering the North Korean market was not currently possible. Again, rumors persisted that the building was unsound, and this was compounded when in 2014, a 23 story apartment building in the city collapsed, killing an unknown number of people. The hotel was abandoned again for the next five years before coming back to life in 2018, when LEDs were installed on its facade, turning the building into the city's biggest light show, as well as a propaganda machine. A four minute program showing North Korea's history and a variety of political slogans was displayed on the building. But the question still remains, will this huge building ever open its doors? What is its purpose, seeing as North Korea does not welcome tourists? They even arrested and locked up an Australian student who was studying in the country, just for taking a photo of the new signage, accusing him of committing spying acts against the state. The Mysterious Double Death of Kim Il-sung Bitter enemies North and South Korea are separated by the Korean Demilitarized Zone, or DMZ for short, a strip of land running across the Korean peninsula that serves as a buffer zone between the two countries. Between 1953 and 2004, both sides broadcast audio propaganda across the DMZ through massive loudspeakers they erected. However, in 2004, the North and South agreed to end the broadcasts, although some broadcasts have resumed at certain high tension times over the years. On November 15, 1986, a short story appeared in a South Korean newspaper reporting rumors from Japan that the North Korean leader, Kim Il-sung, was dead. As these rumors were a common occurrence, no one took much notice. However, the next day, at midday, the South Koreans heard sad music emanating from North Korean amplifiers. Only music, not a single word. Soon after, they started to read Kim Il-sung's biography through the megaphones and began to broadcast a message hailing the great leader. Then at 8 p.m. that evening, the North Koreans finally came out with the shocking revelation. Kim Il-sung had been shot and was dead, and his son, Kim Jong-il, had inherited power, and he was immediately named president and marshal. By 10.45 that same evening, the North Korean flag hoisted near the DMZ had been lowered as a sign of mourning. The next day, South Korea was in total confusion and panic, the implications of a new leader in North Korea could be dire, and police and soldiers were put on high alert. The situation was further amplified when the North Koreans began taunting the South Korean government, saying the world has a good view of South Korea. South Korean President Chun assembled an emergency meeting of the cabinet, and among the documents shown to the ministers was a message from an American general who was in command of the US Army in Korea, claiming that Kim Il-sung died in a car accident and was not murdered. The cabinet realized that something was going on, but no one could fathom out what it was. The situation was very serious, and the government thought there was a reasonable chance of an imminent North Korean invasion, although bizarrely, there was still no official proof of Kim Il-sung's death, and wild rumors began to circulate. Meanwhile, messages were still being broadcast across DMZ about the leader's demise, although some of them were contradictory. At 25 past one, this was announced. Respected comrade Kim Jong-il is the eternal leader of our nation. Then two hours later, under the respected comrade Kim Jong-il, even greater happiness awaits us. Then at six o'clock, Oh Chin Yu and the third man in the country as reader's reminder, took power. The North Korean people actively support him. Then at 8.45, don't believe the groundless rumors about the demise of our leader, Kim Il-sung. Then at four minutes past 10, after sad music, the big star of our nation has fallen. Then at 12.06, the words read, Kim Il-sung resigned and transferred power to the party's leadership. On the northern side of the DMZ, all households were hanging pieces of black clothing from their eaves in a sign of mourning. Then on November 18th at 10 in the morning, Kim Il-sung, alive and well, appeared in person at a nearby airport to meet a Mongolian delegation. On the same day, messages about him being dead stopped without any explanation. No mention of the incident was ever talked about again. Kim Il-sung went on to rule North Korea until his death in 1994. Nearly 35 years have passed since, and no one knows what really happened over those days in 1986. 
Was it a mistake? Maybe there was some misreporting? This seems unlikely due to the DMZ announcements, or was it a personal initiation of, of one of the propagandists on the DMZ? Or was it a failed coup? If so, the conspirators would be long dead, almost certainly executed. The only other explanation is that Kim Il-sung personally decided to check how the world, and especially South Korea, would react to his death. But it seems that it might have backfired, as it was a bit like crying wolf. Nobody really believed it had happened, and were waiting for the official confirmation, which never came. North Korean Ghost Chips For many years, boats have been washing up on the western shores of Japan. Many of them are either empty or contain the bodies or skeletal remains of men. The boats are often old rickety, very simple vessels with no modern engines or navigation instruments on board. Because the boats were washed up empty or with only dead bodies, it wasn't initially clear where they had come from. But some observers theorized that they were North Korean fishing boats searching for king crab, squid, and sandfish, and they were soon dubbed the North Korean ghost ships. Markings on some of the Korean vessels did indicate that they belonged to the North's military, which is heavily involved in the fishing industry. It's normal practice that when a boat with corpses washes ashore, officials try to investigate the cause of death. But as the Korean bodies tended to be in an advanced state of decomposition, it was impossible to determine that. But it was speculated that these poorly equipped boats either blew off course or got lost during the winter months, and the crew either died of starvation or exposure. But nothing conclusive was determined, and sadly no one looked for the men. However, in 2017, several ships washed ashore with the crew still alive. They all claimed they were fishermen from North Korea who had gotten into trouble at sea. It was initially thought they were defectors trying to escape the North Korean regime. But remarkably, all crews found alive have asked to be sent back to North Korea. So why would fishermen take such a huge risk? While it could be because international sanctions are tightening due to Pyongyang's nuclear and missile tests, meaning the regime is under pressure to boost agriculture and food supplies. So with the North Korean leadership demanding bigger catches, sailors are being forced to take risks to meet those targets. This coupled with the fact that North Korea sold the fishing rights in some of its territorial waters at China last year, means there is a small area for local fishermen to fish in. Hence, they might be having to venture further out to sea. Of course, there are others who believe these men, who are taking huge risks, could be spies. However, like most things in North Korea, we will probably never find out the real reason. So many are prepared to go out into dangerous water in an unequipped boat, knowing that if they did get into trouble or go missing, no one from their home country would care enough to look for them. And so, the mystery rolls on. Megumi Yokota On the 15th of November 1977, 13-year-old Megumi Yokota left her badminton practice in Nagata, Japan, and started the seven-minute walk to her home, but she never made it. Her mother began to panic ringing around to check if anyone had seen her daughter, but no one had. Soon, police and tracker dogs were out in the darkness searching for Megumi. They scoured the beach and pine forest near her home, but found nothing. Out of sea, speeding towards the Korean peninsula, was a boat manned by North Korean agents. Locked in the hold was a terrified Megumi. In the year that followed, police searched endlessly, and a kidnapping unit was set up at the Yokota house but the investigation drew an agonizing blank. Nearly 20 years later in 1993, a North Korean spy who defected to the South told in detail about an abducted Japanese woman who matched Megumi's description. Her abduction was an unplanned blunder. At the time, Megumi was walking home. Two agents were finishing up a spy mission in Nagata and were waiting on the beach for a pickup boat but they realized they had been spotted by Megumi, and fearing she might identify them, they abducted her. At the time, they didn't realize Megumi was just a child. When they arrived back in North Korea, they were in trouble for taking the schoolgirl. Megumi cried for her mother and refused to eat, unnerving her staid minders. So to soothe her, they promised that if she worked hard and learned fluent Korean, she would be allowed to go home. Of course, that was a lie, and instead they forced Megumi to work as a spy trainer teaching Japanese language and behavior at an elite school for espionage. 
Megumi wasn't the only young person abducted for such activities by North Korea, but she was the youngest. North Korea later admitted to kidnapping 13 Japanese citizens. For the first two decades after Megumi disappeared, the Okotas had nothing but a cold case and their own desperate need to understand what had happened. Then in 1997, Pyongyang finally agreed to investigate and announced they had information that Megumi was still alive and living in North Korea. So for her family, the question was, how do we get her back? The Okotas went public with their kidnap story and appeared on primetime TV, and questions were raised in parliament and the government publicly confirmed that Megumi was not an isolated case. They got a breakthrough when it was revealed that in 1986, Megumi had married a South Korean national, likely also abducted, and the couple had a daughter in 1987. But later, her husband claimed that Megumi hanged herself in a pine forest on the 13th of April 1994, on the grounds of a Pyongyang mental hospital where she was being treated for depression. Although her family and many others believe he was speaking under duress and was just reading from a prepared script when he made these claims. In another twist, two years after declaring Megumi dead, North Korean officials handed over to her parents what is said were her ashes. They arrived in 2004 on the 27th anniversary of her kidnapping. Her parents had kept their daughter's umbilical cord when she was born, a Japanese tradition, and DNA tests were performed. The samples did not match. It is widely believed, especially in Japan, that Megumi is still alive. But in November 2011, a South Korean magazine stated that a 2005 directory of Pyongyang residents listed a woman named Kim Ung Gong, with the same birth date as Megumi, who was living with her husband, Kim Yong Nam. Sources later claimed that Kim Ung Gong was actually Megumi's 24 year old daughter, and in March 2014, Megumi's parents were allowed to meet their granddaughter for the first time in Mongolia along with her own baby daughter, their great-grandchild. In recent years, five of the 13 Japanese citizens abducted back in the 1970s have been reunited with their families. But the fate of Megumi is still unknown. Her father died, not knowing whether his daughter was alive or dead. But her aging mother and brothers still live in hope of finding her one day. Is Kim Jong-un still alive? In 2020, there was a frenzy of articles claiming King Jong-un was gravely ill. Normally, reliable sources reported he was in grave danger, possibly as a result of a botched operation. Others claimed he was in a coma or brain dead. The reports seem to have originated from Daily NK, a South Korean website which monitors news, gossip and rumors from North Korea. It stated on April 20th, 2020, that Kim was recovering from unspecified heart surgery to resolve a condition caused by his heavy smoking, obesity and fatigue, and that he was in a stable condition. It was noted by other news outlets that he hadn't been seen in public since April 11th, and more significantly, he had failed to show up for the annual ceremony on April 15th, marking the Day of the Sun, the anniversary of the birthday of Kim Il-sung and Kim's grandfather. It wasn't long before Western news outlets such as CNN reported that the United States was monitoring intelligence that Kim was in grave danger after surgery. The story cited several unnamed sources who insisted Kim's health scare was credible, but the severity was hard to assess. Soon after, the story exploded around the world with various theories, including he had died of COVID or that his guard had shot him. On Twitter, Kim Jong dead was trending. Focus soon turned to who his successor would be, with his sister Kim Yo Jong in line to succeed him. Amongst the murk and speculation, Donald Trump, the then President of the United States, waded in saying, I have a good relationship with Kim Jong Un, and I hope he's okay. A few days later, Trump said he had a very good idea about Kim's health, but that he couldn't talk about it. The world was confused, and many believed the reports about Kim's health must be true. And so the world waited to learn if a rogue, unpredictable, nuclear-armed state still had its hereditary leader, or whether it might be plunged into a power struggle. Then, as if laughing at the rest of the world, Kim Jong-un appeared in a slate-issued photo 
in which he was shown cutting the ribbon on a new fertilizer factory outside Pyongyang, looking very much alive. This development was a bit awkward for CNN and many other news outlets around the world, as well as a few intelligence agencies, which had spent the past few weeks in a frenzy over Kim's health, providing yet again that nothing about North Korea, or more specifically Kim Jong-un, can be trusted. It also throws doubt on the so-called intelligence and how much we truly know about North Korea. In light of Kim's reappearance, there are now rumors that he uses a body double and so could still be dead or gravely ill. But like everything in North Korea, I guess we'll never know. Kathy Hobbs. From an early age, Kathy Hobbs had a premonition that she would not live to be 16. It was a feeling she shared with her friends and family and it was something that affected her mental health. Although as she entered her teens and her family moved to an apartment complex in Las Vegas, Kathy appeared to have conquered her fears and made several friends and was much happier. However, as her 16th birthday approached, her fears started to resurface and Kathy once again believed her death was imminent. She began spending all of her time in her bedroom and refused to leave the house. On the morning of her 16th birthday, Kathy woke up surprised and relieved that she was still alive. After this, she seemed to overcome her anxiety once more and told her family that she now believed her premonitions were unfounded and she began living a normal teenage life. Kathy became more outgoing and started to spend time with friends again. She also developed an interest in beauty products and wanted to pursue a career as a beautician. She even planned to open her own hair salon called Cat's Cuts. Three months after her 16th birthday, on the night of July 23rd, 1987, Kathy was in her room reading a book. At 11 p.m., she told her mother, Vivian, that she was popping to a nearby supermarket to purchase another book. Her mother thought she was meeting up with friends to take the short walk to the shop. However, it appears none of her friends were about that night, so Kathy went to the shop alone. At around 3 a.m., Vivian woke up, unaware that her daughter hadn't returned home. She later said when she woke up, it felt like someone had hit her on the head, and afterwards she had a peaceful feeling and felt that it was over, although at the time she did not understand the meaning of what she felt. The next morning Vivian discovered that her daughter's bed was empty. In a panicked state, she contacted the police and an intense search began. Kathy's disappearance generated a lot of local publicity, and it was soon established that she had made it to the supermarket and purchased a book although her movements after she left the shop were unknown. Nine days later, a geologist looking for rock crystals discovered Kathy's body in a remote field near Lake Mead, about an hour's drive from Las Vegas. Investigators found tire prints at the scene, which showed that a vehicle had pulled in, turned around and left. Two rocks found near her body were covered in Kathy's blood, and the coroner determined that she had died from repeated blows to the head. She had also been sexually assaulted. Sadly, it appeared that Kathy's premonition had come true. After her death, Kathy's family discovered letters that she had written to them. The letters were dated one month before her 16th birthday, and in them she talked about how much she loved her family and did not want them to be upset about her death. On October 24th, exactly three months after Kathy vanished, a message was left on an answer machine at the Las Vegas Police Department. The anonymous caller claimed he had witnessed Kathy's abduction and that he saw two men dragging her into a car. He also claimed one of the abductors' names was Robbie and gave the correct location of where Kathy was last seen, along with an accurate description of what she was wearing that night. The caller, who did not leave his name or number, claimed that he did not contact police sooner because he had been out of town for several months. He also gave a license plate number for the abductor's car but when the police checked it, they found that it didn't exist. Despite repeated appeals, the caller has never come forward or contacted again. To this day, the case remains unsolved, but has become a topic of conversation on internet forums, especially Reddit, with many resonating with Kathy's premonition of dying at an early age. As with all internet discussions, there are differing opinions about what happened to Kathy. It's widely believed that she was a victim of serial killer Michael Lee Lockhart, although because he had already been sentenced to death in four other states, 
For other murders, Nevada did not pursue prosecution, and in 1997 he was executed. His lack of conviction sparked outrage and debate online, and it seems the key to solving the case still lies with the anonymous caller, who left that message over 30 years ago. The Mystery Song This mystery has endured for over 30 years, and has become known as the most mysterious song on the internet. Before we look at the details, you're going to have to listen to it. Nothing particularly unusual about it, just a normal pop song of the 80s era, except nobody knows who sung it, the name of the track, who wrote it, or where it originated from. The song was recorded straight from the radio onto a cassette in around 1984 by a man named Dorius, who recorded it along with several others from a German radio station called NDR. He labelled it Cassette 4, and it was part of a mixtape that included other artists from the time such as XTC and The Cure. Darius purposefully did not include presentations of radio hosts, so he could get seamless, clean recordings, which is why the air date and the name of the song is unknown. In 1985, Darius created another mixtape consisting of all the unknown songs in his collection, and later digitalized the songs. In 2004, he started uploading them to a website to try and establish the artists. However, the mystery song was never identified, in 2017, Darius's sister Linda posted the song on a news group, and eventually onto other music websites, but still no one came forward. In 2019, a Brazilian teenager named Gabriel da Silva Vieira uploaded the song to YouTube and Reddit, and that is when the fascination in finding the origins of the music went viral. The search was further helped when YouTuber Justin Wang posted an episode of Tales from the Internet discussing the song and subsequently made four further episodes in search of the owner. Since then, many contacts have been made, including Paul Baskerville, the DJ of the show from which the song was likely taped, as well as GEMA, a German government and performance rights organization. YouTube channel named 80s Forever, who is known for uploading obscure music tracks, was also contacted. On July 10th, 2020, it was ruled out that Baskerville had played the song, and so the mystery rumbles on. In the latest update, Reddit user Flex and Mobile has again contacted NDR archivists for 1983 and 1984 playlists for other DJs, and is currently waiting for a response. If any of you know anything about the song, we would love to hear it in the comments, and if you'd like to dig further into this mystery, then check out the links in the description. The Death of Philip Taylor Kramer Philip Taylor Kramer was the one-time bassist for American rock band Iron Butterfly. Kramer joined the band in 1974 and helped them record the albums Scorching Beauty and Sun and Steel. After leaving the band in 1980, Kramer dropped Philip from his name and went back to college and earned a degree in aerospace engineering, which led to him working for the US Department of Defense. In 1990, at the age of 38, Kramer co-founded Total Multimedia Incorporation with Michael Jackson's brother Randy Jackson to develop data compression techniques for CD-ROMs. In 1992, the firm claimed it had developed the first video compression capable of producing full motion video from a single speed CD-ROM. However, in 1994, the company was reorganized under bankruptcy and hired new leadership, although Kramer continued working there and he co-developed soft video 
based on fractal compression. He also claimed to be working on a transmission project that would result in faster than light speed communications, a controversial project that if succeeded would discredit Albert Einstein's theory. Things appeared to be going well. However, on February 12th, 1995, Kramer was due to pick up his associate, Greg Martini and his wife from the airport and take them back to his home for a relaxing evening with his family. Unexpectedly, Kramer called his wife to tell her the plans had changed and when he got home, he had a big surprise for her. He then called his old friend and Iron Butterfly bandmate, Ron Bushy. He said, Bush, it's Taylor. I love you more than life itself, then hung up. After that, he called his wife again and told her, whatever happens, I'll always be with you. At 11.59 a.m., Kramer made a 911 call and told the operator, this is Philip Taylor Kramer. I'm going to kill myself and I want everyone to know O.J. Simpson is innocent. They did it. That was the last anyone heard of him. Police searches began, but produced nothing. And for more than four years, it was as if Philip Taylor Kramer had vanished into thin air. Then on May 29th, 1999, Kramer's van was spotted by hikers at the bottom of a ravine in Decker Canyon near Malibu, California. Remains were found inside the vehicle and later identified through dental records as belonging to Kramer. His death was ruled as probable suicide by authorities, although his family refused to believe he would have left his family like that. His wife is quoted as saying he would never, for any reason or under any circumstances, allow himself to completely abandon the family he loves more than life itself. Over the years, Kramer's disappearance and eventual death has been the subject of many online conspiracies and internet sleuths have tried to get to the bottom of why a successful family man suddenly changed his plans and ended up dead. The case is also featured amongst others on high profile shows such as The Oprah Winfrey Show, America's Most Wanted and Unsolved Mysteries. It seems no coincidence that in the days before he disappeared, he was working on perfecting a top secret 30 year formula that would disprove Einstein and change the course of history. The formula was based on a theory that linked faster than light communications like we said. If successful, it would have been worth billions. Kramer's father said that his son had told him that people were giving him problems and they wanted what he was doing. Several of them apparently even threatening him. He told his father, if I ever say I'm going to kill myself, don't you believe it? I'm gonna be needing help. Circleville Letters. In 1976, several Circleville, Ohio residents began receiving strange letters detailing personal information about their lives. Local bus driver, Mary Gillis Pye, was accused of having an affair with Gordon Macy the superintendent of schools. The writer told Mary that they had been observing her house and knew she had children. The letters were postmarked Columbus, Ohio, but had no return address. Initially, Mary kept the letters to herself until her husband, Ron, also received one. His message was more ominous. It stated that if Ron did not stop his wife's affair, his life would be in danger. Two weeks later, the writer threatened to go public with the affair allegation and would broadcast it on TVs, CB radios, and billboards. Mary and Ron decided to tell somebody what was happening to them, so they first went to Ron's sister Karen, her husband Paul, and Paul's sister. Mary had a gut feeling that a fellow bus driver, David Longberry, was behind the letters, as she had rebuffed his sexual advances. So they decided that Paul would write a letter to Longberry telling him they knew it was him and insisting that he stop. The plan appeared to work and the letters stopped for several weeks, but soon large signs started to appear around the town, claiming that Macy and the Gill Spy's 12 year old daughter were involved in a sexual relationship. Soon Ron was getting up extra early in the morning to drive around town and remove the signs before his daughter spotted them on her way to school. On August 19th, 1977, Ron received a phone call from the alleged writer. The call seemed to confirm Ron's suspicions on the identity of the writer, and in a rage, he grabbed his gun and drove off in his pickup truck. A few minutes later, Ron's truck was discovered crashed into a tree and he was found dead inside. 
Investigators later revealed that Ron had fired at least one shot from his gun before crashing. Local Sheriff Dwight Radcliffe questioned and eliminated the suspect in the case after he passed a polygraph test and ruled Ron's death an accident, claiming he had lost control and crashed while driving the truck. It was revealed that Ron's blood alcohol level was twice the legal limit. This surprised Ron's family and friends as he was not a heavy drinker but residents of Circleville continued to receive letters and suspected that Sheriff Radcliffe had been involved in a cover-up. In a bizarre twist, Mary acknowledged that she was in a relationship with the superintendent, although she claimed it did not start until after the letters were sent. The campaign of harassment against Mary continued and more and more signs began appearing along the side of the road on Mary's bus route. On February 7th, 1983, Mary decided she'd had enough and stopped her bus and got out to rip one of the signs down. When she did, she discovered a booby trap designed to kill her. The trap had a box which contained a small pistol. If Mary had pulled the sign off a certain way, the gun would have fired. After telling the police, the gun was examined and the partially rubbed off serial number was revealed. It was determined that the gun belonged to Paul Freshhauer, who had recently separated from Ron's sister. Paul was arrested and charged with attempted murder of his sister-in-law, and although he was never charged with writing the threatening letters, a handwriting expert testified that Paul was the letter writer. Paul proclaimed his innocence, but was found guilty and was convicted of attempted murder, being sentenced to 7 to 24 years in jail. But get this, whilst in prison, Paul and the residents of Circleville continued to receive letters the letters were postmarked from Columbus, and Paul was in solitary confinement in Lima, but he was still suspected of writing them. In December 1990, Paul became eligible for parole, but it was denied due to the letters, even though there was no way that he could have been sending them. Interestingly, the letters stopped in 1994, the same year Paul was finally paroled, although he continued to maintain his innocence until his death in 2012. Over the years, many names have been put forward as potential suspects, including Gordon, Macy's son, and Paul's ex-wife and her boyfriend, although nothing has been proved. When Unsolved Mysteries covered the story, they received a postcard, apparently from the letter writer, that ominously read, Forget Circleville, Ohio. Do nothing to hurt Sheriff Radcliffe. If you come to Ohio, you Al Sickles will pay. Signed, The Circleville Writer. Despite all the new names and theories to come forward, the police still maintain that Paul Freshhauer was the Circleville writer. Judging by the evidence we have, this seems somewhat unlikely, and some believe it's impossible given the fact letters were still being sent when he was in prison. There are so many twists and turns in this case that we could probably do a whole video on it, but it seems there was a lot more going on in Circleville than just the letters. To date, the identity of the Circleville writer still remains unsolved. The Persian Princess The Persian Princess, or Persian Mummy, is a mummy of an alleged Persian princess who surfaced in Pakistan in October 2000. After considerable attention and further investigation, the mummy proved to be an archaeological forgery and possibly a murder victim. In 2000, Pakistani authorities were alerted to a videotape recorded by Ali Akbar, in which he claimed to have a mummy for sale. Akbar was questioned by police and told them that the mummy was being kept at the home of tribal leader Wali Muhammad Riki in Karan, near the border of Afghanistan. Riki said he had acquired the mummy from an Iranian man who said he had found it after an earthquake. The mummy had been put up for sale by Akbar on the black antiques market for 600 million rupee, the equivalent of 11 million dollars. Both Riki and Akbar were accused of violating the country's Antiquities Act, a charge which carries a maximum sentence of 10 years in prison. The mummy was seized, and in a press conference on October 26, 2000, a Pakistani archaeologist announced that the mummy appeared to be a princess, dated circa 600 BC. The body was wrapped in ancient Egyptian style, and was in a gilded wooden coffin, with cuneiform carvings inside a stone sarcophagus. The coffin had been carved with a large Faravahar image, and the mummy was resting on a layer of wax and honey, and had a golden crown on its brow. An inscription on the golden chestplate 
claimed that she was the relatively unknown daughter of a famous king. It was speculated that she might have been an Egyptian princess married to a Persian prince or a daughter of the King Cyrus the Great. This was a very important find and the governments of Iran and Pakistan soon began to argue about the ownership of the mummy. In November 2000, the mummy was placed on display in the National Museum of Pakistan. However, news of the Persian princess prompted American archaeologist Oscar White Muscarelli to describe an incident the previous March when he was shown photographs of a similar mummy that he suspected was a forgery and he informed Interpol through the FBI. The curator of the National Museum of Pakistan was alerted about the forgery and did further studies of the Persian princess and a report was published on April 17, 2001. In it, it states that the Persian princess was in fact a woman about 21 to 25 years of age who had died around 1996, possibly killed with a blunt instrument to the lower back pelvic region and possibly hit by a vehicle from behind. Her teeth had been removed at her death and her hip joint, pelvis and backbone was damaged before the body had been filled with powder. The mummy was a fake and police began to investigate a possible murder and arrested a number of suspects. The Eddy Foundation, a Pakistani warfare organization, took custody of the body and announced their intentions to bury the woman with proper burial rites. However, her body lay in a morgue for the next three years until she was finally afforded a funeral in 2008. The woman has never been identified and in death, she went from being sought over as a Persian princess resting in a gold plated coffin displayed in a national museum to being the forgotten victim of a vicious murder after the whole thing was revealed as a hoax. There is a planet that is darker than coal. Would you believe that there is a planet that is darker than coal? Well, there is. Tres 2b is 750 light years away from our solar system. And there it lies, a gaseous Jupiter-sized world that astronomers have called Tres 2b. Despite its unassuming name, this exoplanet holds the honor of being the darkest known exoplanet out there, reflecting less than 1% of the light that hits it. Jupiter, with its red and white clouds, reflects over 30% of the light that reaches it from the Sun. Tres 2b has no reflective clouds, and what's more unusual is how close it is to its parent star. Whereas the Earth is about 95 million miles away from the Sun, Tres 2b is only about 3 million miles away from its star, which heats its atmosphere to a raging 980 degrees Celsius and gives the gas giant a very faint red glow much like the coils on an electrical stove. Despite this, however, the exoplanet is darker than the darkest acrylic paint you can buy at the store. In fact, it appears to be darker than nearly anything else, with perhaps the notable exception of a black hole. Scientists aren't sure how such a hot planet could be so dark, but one promising theory posits that light absorbing chemicals like vaporized sodium and potassium or gaseous titanium oxide are large components of its atmosphere. There is a planet that has winds blowing at seven times the speed of sound. Approximately 65 light years away, there is another hot Jupiter-like planet with the equally unassuming name of HD 189733b. Like Tres 2b, this large gas giant is about 30 times closer to its parent star than Earth, than Earth is to the Sun, and is well over a thousand degrees Celsius. There is a twist, however, as this planet orbits its star in only two days, resulting in windstorms unlike anything we can imagine here on Earth. With winds that blow up to 54,000 miles per hour, any would-be visitor to this exoplanet would instantly get caught up in a sickening spiral around the planet. For context, some of the fastest fighter planes in human history have been able to get up to 44,000 miles per hour at their peak speeds, and the sound of speed is a little under 770 miles per hour. Now, not only are the winds terrifying and dangerously close to inconceivable, but it's what the wind carries with it that pushes this planet into the realm of being surreal. As the atmosphere of the planet contains large clouds filled with silicate particles, that are constantly exposed to massive heating and wind. It's more than likely that this exoplanet features a perpetual sideways rain of molten glass. 
This hazy, blow-torched planet is a victim of its proximity to its own parent star, and is one of the strangest gas giants in the cosmos. There is a planet that has burning ice. GJ436b is a Neptune-sized exoplanet orbiting a small and relatively cool red star, approximately 30 light years away from Earth. This exoplanet is home to an apparent paradox in the form of burning ice. Yes, ice that is so hot it can vaporize a human being on contact. Typical gas giants are largely composed of hydrogen and helium and have significant quantities of methane in their atmospheres. However, this exoplanet's size, density, and atmospheric content indicate to astronomers that GJ436b is anything but typical. Instead, it has far less methane and far more carbon monoxide than it should. Despite carbon monoxide being scarce above certain temperatures, temperatures that the planet regularly reaches due to its close proximity to its star, the only way that such a large amount of carbon monoxide could be present on the planet was if somehow there was also water present. That was when scientists realized that GJ436b is one of the strangest things in space that we have ever discovered. Ultimately, astronomers think that the planet contains a large amount of an exotic form of water ice that they have dubbed Ice 10, on top of a dense and rocky core. So then one has to ask, how does water remain solid like ice at these high temperatures? Astronomers say the immense gravity of the planet is powerful enough to compress the vaporizing water in the atmosphere and prevent it from reverting to its liquid form, trapping it as a solid on the planet. But the temperature is still incredibly high due to the star at orbits, keeping the water on the planet in an icy yet boiling form. How incredible is that? The two-faced HAL world, Gliese 581c. Gliese 581c is a type of exoplanet called a super-Earth, meaning that it has many of the same characteristics that Earth has, such as being dense and rocky, as well as being within the habitable zone of its parent star. What makes it super is the fact that the exoplanet has a mass about 5.5 times that of Earth, 581c seemed, at first blush, to be a great candidate for life, but the more scientists learned about this distant planet, the more they began to realize what a hellish landscape it really is. Firstly, the planet is tidal locked, meaning that it always presents the same side of the star that it orbits, like our moon does to the Earth. This results in a planet split in two, with one half constantly beaten by the heat of its parent star and the other half submerged in perpetual sub-arctic darkness. Gale force winds would perpetually surge from the hot side of the planet to the cold side, causing regular windstorms. The sky would be a bloody crimson color due to the red dwarf star the planet orbits. If life similar to life on Earth can be found on this planet, it'll only be found on the thin strip of land that forms a sort of meridian between the two extremes of the climate. This stormy, twilight area could potentially house life, although it would likely look quite different from what we are used to. Should plants evolve on the planet, they would possibly be pitch black in colour, so as to most efficiently absorb light in their dim, infrared-rich environment. Gliese 581c would doubtlessly be a strange planet to land on. The Gargantuans, Stars and Black Holes The universe has produced some truly baffling planets, but the undefeated champions of the incomprehensible are without a doubt mighty stars and their undead counterparts, black holes. Both stars and black holes can take on nearly immeasurable sizes and are often some of the most powerful makers of change in the universe. Our own star, the Sun, is a massive ball of fiery plasma that is about 109 times the diameter of Earth and about 330,000 times the mass. The largest star yet known is called Stephenson 218 and it makes our sun look like a pebble, clocking in at 1,075 times the diameter of our own home star. 
That makes the volume of Stephenson 218 10 billion times greater than the volume of our sun. If this massive star took the place of our own, every planet up to, and including Saturn, would be completely engulfed by its flames. But what happens when a star that big dies? While there is a chance, it can become, like the recently discovered black hole, called J2157. This monster of the dark is about 34 billion times as massive as our own sun, and is 8,000 times larger than the so-called supermassive black hole at the centre of our Milky Way galaxy. This ancient behemoth consumes an average of one sun-sized star a day, and has been raging in our cosmos for around 12 billion years, consuming all within its massive reach. The crazy thing is that research has shown that there is no indication that it will ever stop. ISS Live Feed Mystery This next one is something we picked up from a UK newspaper in April of 2020. It hasn't gained much attention, but we thought it was interesting and worth a look. The strange anomaly was spotted on the International Space Station Live Feed on April 23rd, 2020 by Drew Jones, who has been watching the feeds religiously for the past two years. He claims this is the first time he has ever seen anything like it, and thinks it might be a genuine UFO. Jones later uploaded the raw footage to his YouTube channel, Mad Cat Mysteries, and understandably, it sparked a bit of a debate. Take a look at the footage, and look out for the orb-like light that travels on screen right to left and then appears to change direction before reappearing from the left and disappearing. Take a look. Now we have to agree that looks strange. It's obviously traveling at speed, although we are unsure whether the larger looking orb that comes back into view from the left is the same orb, changing trajectory, or it's a different one. There could be a perfectly plausible explanation for both orbs, and it has been suggested is just space junk. However, Jones, who would be familiar with what space junk looks like, is adamant it is the strangest thing he's ever seen in the two years he's been monitoring the live feed. One thing that I do know, however, is that space junk does not change trajectory. And if whatever this is, is one object, then it can't be space junk. Others believe it could be a satellite or ice crystals, both of which are possible, but unconfirmed explanations. If any of you have any idea what it could be, we would love to hear in the comments section, as so far, there doesn't seem to be a satisfactory explanation. So for now, we can call this one a UFO. Google Earth exposes a stranded UFO docked in Antarctica waters. In April 2020, UFO and alien conspiracist Scott Waring claimed to have spotted a triangular alien aircraft buried under ice and snow on La Voisa Island in the Antarctic region. Scott claims he spotted the triangular looking craft while using Google Maps, and he thinks it's possibly a TR-3B an alleged secret US surveillance aircraft said to have been developed under a black project. It's worth pointing out that the only evidence for such an aircraft is based on numerous reported sightings of a mysterious flying triangle aircraft over Antelope Valley, an area of desert in Southern California. The TR-3A was said to be a subsonic stealth spy plane with a flying wing design, and its successor was the TR-3B, allegedly a state-of-the-art space plane that used a top-secret gravitational shielding engine called the Magnetic Field Disruptor. Although many believe the physical description of the MFD engine is not possible and likely wouldn't be able to fly. 
However, there are still those that believe in its existence, and over the years, this has been fueled by conspiracy theorists. Take a look at the Google map image and see what you think. The most likely explanation is that after years of a warmer climate, the ice and snow have melted, revealing a rock formation below. Only time will reveal what is really under all that snow and ice. SpaceX mystery as UFO appears on Starlink live feed. This next UFO came into view on SpaceX's live Starlink feed, but mystery surrounds what it was after it was edited out of the original footage. The mysterious moment took place during the launch of SpaceX Starlink from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida on the 19th of March 2020, when a new batch of 60 Starlink satellites were launched into orbit in an accelerating campaign to deploy a globe-spanning network of internet relay satellites. However, space enthusiasts who were watching the live footage noticed a mysterious UFO appearing near the Falcon 9 rocket soon after the deployment of the satellites. It raised discussions of conspiracy theories as SpaceX apparently cut the live feed seconds after the huge cigar-shaped object came into view. Take a look. The original footage was shared online, and it caused a bit of a stir. The object appeared to be cigar-shaped, and seemed to become brighter and bigger as it hovers in space, and viewers were concerned at how close the rocket came to the unexplained object. It later emerged that the launch speed was cut every time an unexplained object came into view, and the fact that neither SpaceX or NASA have offered explanations for this has only fueled the conspiracy theories. This one rumbles on, and speculation will continue until a definitive answer is given. What's your thoughts? On April 9th, 2020, at around 7.40pm, Luke Cradock's wife was outside in their garden, in the Bath area of the UK, when she called him to come and witness what she was seeing falling in the sky. At first, they assumed it was an aeroplane due to the white vapor trail it left behind, although given the situation at the time, very few aircrafts were flying. However, it looked like it was falling at a very slow speed rather than moving away from them and continued to fall for nearly 10 minutes when the white vapor trail changed to thick black smoke. Puzzled by what they saw, Luke posted the footage online and a friend came forward and claimed to have also seen it, although he lives over 100 miles away in London. The Craddocks were expecting the strange object to make the news and were surprised that there was no mention of it in the local paper or on Facebook. They put this down to the strict lockdown we are experiencing and the fact no one would have been out and about. The only possible explanation is that in April, the sky was quite active with meteor showers although generally, these pass quite quickly, and this did not. The Craddocks are still trying to find out what exactly they witnessed, so if any of you have any idea what it might be, or even witnessed it yourself, we would love to hear in the comments. Mexican Volcano Popocatépetl is Mexico's largest volcano and the second largest in North America, and has long been the subject of conspiracy theorists who believe it's used as an alien city. This theory has been compounded in recent weeks when a white object was filmed. The sighting was made on webcams which constantly monitor the 5,426 meter tall volcano, nicknamed Al Popo. Take a look.
that is pretty impressive. The footage has convinced conspiracy theorists that not only is it proof of aliens, but also proof that the Mexican government is in the know, and are in contact with the extraterrestrials. This is just further proof that the alien base does exist, and that the aliens living there have very large spacecrafts, according to the theorists. This is not the first time strange anomalies have been seen on the webcams, as on several other occasions, UFOs have been seen exiting and entering the volcano. A similar video emerged last year that showed a bright, curved light making its way up the side of the volcano, before suddenly disappearing. We agree, these appear to be strange anomalies, but whether they are crafts flying in and out of an airbase, we'll leave up to you. So let us know your thoughts in the comments. Fen's Gold The Fen treasure is a cache of gold and jewels that Forrest Fen, an art dealer and author, claims is hidden in the Rocky Mountains of the United States. Forrest Fen was a decorated US Air Force pilot in the Vietnam War, who when he retired in the 1970s, opened a successful art gallery in Santa Fe that specialized in American Indian artifacts. By the 1980s, the gallery was estimated to gross $6 million a year, but things took a turn for the worst in 1988 when Fenn was diagnosed with cancer and told that it was likely terminal. The grim news inspired him to hide a treasure chest in an outdoor location with the purpose of creating a public search for it. He also intended the location to be his final resting place. However, thankfully, Fenn recovered from his illness, and in 2010, Self published a book titled The Thrill of the Chase, a memoir. In the book, he describes a treasure chest that contains gold nuggets, rare coins, jewelry, and gemstones, and reveals that when he thought he was going to die, he hid the chest in the mountains somewhere north of Santa Fe. It's believed the contents of the chest are estimated to be worth around $2 million, possibly more. Fenn explains that the stories in his book contain hints to the location of the treasure, and a poem found in the chapter called Gold and More holds nine clues that will guide a searcher to the spot. Fenn describes the buried chest as a forged bronze 12th century box with a wood liner and locking front clasp, weighing about 22 pounds, and measuring 10 by 10 by 5 inches. The outside is embellished with scenes of knights scaling walls on ladders, with maidens above throwing flowers down upon them. This appears to be a reference to the poem, Le Roman de la Rose, about the pursuit of love and scaling the castle of love, which was popular in the 12th century. After the release of the book on October 25th, 2010, the public treasure hunt began in the Rocky Mountains of New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, and Montana. In the 10 years since, as many as 500,000 amateur treasure hunters have searched for the elusive chest, they have become known as chasers or fenners. However, for some, it hasn't always been a fun pursuit. So far, five people have died while searching for the treasure and it seems people are willing to risk their lives in pursuit of the riches. Things got so bad that in 2017, the New Mexico State Police Sheriff publicly appealed to Fenn to end the treasure hunt because it was a danger to public safety. Then in December 2019, David Harold Hansen of Colorado Springs filed a lawsuit in the US District Court against Forrest Fenn alleging Fenn had made several fraudulent statements and deceived searchers. The allegations have caused some people to speculate that the whole thing is fake and just a ruse to sell the book. However, it's worth pointing out that Forrest Fenn claims to make no money on the sale of the book for fear of being labeled as a fraud by critics. Friends and associates of Fenn are also adamant that it's not a hoax and can vouch for the integrity of Fenn stating it's not in his personality to lie. To date, no one has found the treasure, although diehard chasers and fenners continue to risk their lives in search of the ultimate prize. Where the treasure is, or whether it exists, is still a mystery, 
although at the time of writing this, Forrest Fenn is still very much alive, and only he knows the truth. The Fiji Mermaid The story of the Fiji Mermaid begins in the middle of July 1842, when a mysterious Englishman by the name of Dr. J. Griffin arrived in the United States. Griffin claimed he was a member of the British Lyceum of National History in New York, and he had with him a mermaid, which he claimed had been caught near the Fiji Islands in the South Pacific. Reports of the so-called mermaid soon circulated in the press, and reporters flocked to the hotel where Griffin was staying, demanding to see the creature. Eventually he gave them a glimpse, and after seeing it, they were convinced that it was indeed a real mermaid. Not long after, P.T. Barnum, famous for his circuses and freak shows, got involved and told the press he was trying to convince Griffin to display the mermaid in his museum. However it seemed, Griffin was reluctant to do so. Nevertheless, Barnum prepared posters and pamphlets displaying the typical image of a mermaid, teasing an exhibition showing the creature was imminent. This was of course all a publicity stunt, and soon Griffin's Fiji mermaid became the hottest topic in New York and eventually he agreed to display his mermaid for a week at Concert Hall on Broadway. The week-long exhibition was a hit with the people, and as a result, Griffin allowed the mermaid to be displayed in New York for a longer period of time, and it was displayed in Barnum's American Museum for a month. As well as the exhibition, Griffin also gave lectures to the crowds that came to see the mermaid. However, what the crowd saw was definitely not the beautiful, bare-breasted mermaid as depicted on Barnum's promotional material. Instead, it was the preserved body of some small abomination with a tail. Following the month-long display in Barnum's museum, the Fiji mermaid went on a southern tour, which had to be cut short due to a feud that it sparked in South Carolina. After that, the Fiji mermaid spent the next 20 years between Barnum's Museum and Kimball's Museum in Boston. Then in 1859, the Fiji mermaid went on a tour in London, and when it came back, was again displayed in Kimball's Boston Museum, its last known whereabouts. It would later be revealed that the Fiji mermaid was actually the top half of a juvenile monkey sewn onto the bottom half of a fish and that Dr. Griffin was in fact Levy Lehman, an associate of Barnum's. The whole thing was a hoax, and the famous Fiji mermaid is thought to have been made in Japan around 1810, where this was allegedly a traditional art form amongst fishermen. Barnum's mermaid was bought by Dutch merchants, who then sold it to an American sea captain by the name of Samuel Barrett Eads in 1822. Samuel paid a huge amount of money for the mermaid, but was not able to make a fortune from exhibiting it. Following his death, the mermaid was given to his son, who sold it to Moses Kimball. It was Kimball from whom Barnum had leased the mermaid. However, despite these revelations, those that saw the mermaid believed it to be the real thing and refused to believe the explanation. Today, with the emergence of modern science, it would have been easy to prove or disprove the claims about the mermaid. That's if it hadn't mysteriously disappeared. Allegedly, the Fiji mermaid was destroyed when a fire broke out in Barnum's Museum in 1865. It has, however, been pointed out that at that point of time, the mermaid would have been in Kimball's museum. This prompted people to believe that the Fiji mermaid survived and possibly ended up in Harvard's Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology. It's true that this museum possesses a Fiji mermaid but it's not known whether this is the original mermaid that caused such a stir in the late 1800s. The Bosnian Pyramids, one of the greatest finds ever. In 2005, Bosnian-born anthropologist Dr. Sam Osmanagic announced to the world's media that a group of hills in the vicinity of Visiko, a small town in central Bosnia, were not hills at all but were in fact buried and forgotten pyramids of monumental size and extreme age. The largest of the pyramids was estimated to be at least 300 meters, 900 foot tall, and the smallest, 190 meters or 600 feet tall, over 50 meters taller than the Great Pyramid of Giza. 
After the announcement, Sam was largely ridiculed for his hypothesis, as it based solely on his observations of the shape and formations of the hills that appeared to almost perfectly be orientated towards the cardinal points, north, south, east and west. Although Sam did back his claim up with the countless stories told to him by the local population, whose older generation claimed that they used to play as children in underground tunnels around Visico, tunnels that later had their entrances sealed by authorities during the time of Yugoslavia, and Sam pointed out that subterranean passages and chambers were seen in almost all the known ancient pyramids around the world. He also announced he planned to start work on rediscovering and thus confirming the existence of these underground tunnels. Determined to prove he was right, in 2006, Sam self-financed investigations of the Bosnian pyramids in order to obtain evidence to support his controversial pyramid theory. He used satellites, geo-radar, seismic surveys, and topographic analysis to identify five principal sites to investigate. These sites were later named Pyramid Sun, Moon, Dragon, Love, and Temple of Mother Earth. Archaeological trenches were excavated across all these principal sites and were overseen by Sam and other experts. Results of the material found in the structures seemed to back up the doctor's theory that they were man-made. The material was an artificial, conglomerate geopolymer, and though it looked like natural stone, it had different chemical and mechanical properties to the geographical material found locally. Strength tests measured it to be considerably stronger than both the locally found conglomerates and even modern day concrete. The results indicated these were not just regular hills, but were in fact, at the very least, modified to look like pyramids, or even completely built from the ground up by an ancient civilization, using methods of construction unknown to modern science. Not long after the initial phase of investigations began, the doctor found an opening to the underground tunnel network spoken about by the locals, which would later be named the Raven Tunnels. At the time of discovery, the entrance way was known locally, but was only suspected as being a small cave of no significance. But upon closer inspection, the doctor realized at the rear of the cave, there was an infilled passage. He began excavating the small cave, and what was revealed was a shock to everyone including those who did not believe his pyramid claims. It was not simply the entrances to the tunnels that had been blocked, but seemingly the entire tunnel network had been backfilled with loose rubble. After only a few tens of meters of excavating, they revealed multiple infilled passages heading in different directions, the junctions of which were marked by simple yet beautiful drywall constructions. They clearly indicated that the passages were cut through the solid rock, and their subsequent blockage were not the work of nature, but were done so by intelligent and skilled hands. Hundreds of meters worth of tunnels were exposed and further intriguing discoveries were made. The existence of chambers with multiple passages leading to them were identified. Shaped stones with possible proto-runic language inscribed on them. Also large megalithic blocks clearly out of context with the surrounding geological material were found. All these discoveries continue to support the theory made by the Doctor in 2005 regarding his prehistoric Bosnian Pyramid hypothesis. But despite the evidence, not everyone agreed, and some skeptics continue to make unfounded and somewhat preposterous accusations that Doctor Osmanagic was shaping the hills to look like pyramids, and that he was digging the tunnels himself. Even the European Association of Archaeologists called the Bosnian Pyramid Project a hoax on an unsuspecting public. However, in the years that have followed, further excavation has been done and a small foundation has been set up called the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun Foundation, who are now working with local historians in an effort to raise awareness and acceptance of the Bosnian Pyramids. In 2019, more chambers and connecting passages were discovered that are rich in archaeological material. Analysis of these finds indicated Neolithic, Roman and medieval periods were represented that were at least 6,000 years old. To date, more openings and tunnels are being discovered, and the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun is now regarded as the biggest and oldest pyramid in the world. The Bosnian Pyramids are the mystery that keeps giving, 
whose secrets have remained hidden for thousands of years, and whose purpose and what lies deep in the tunnels is still unknown. They are an exciting example of a new discovery with years of mystery and intrigue still to be uncovered. The Baltic Sea Anomaly In 2011, Swedish explorer Peter Lindenberg and his Ocean X team of marine explorers discovered an object on the ocean bed of the Baltic Sea during a dive searching for a shipwreck. The strangely shaped object showed up on sonar, laying 100 meters or 300 feet beneath the waves. It quickly became known as the Baltic Sea Anomaly, and conspiracy theorists went into overdrive. Many claimed it was finally proof of aliens, and the anomaly was a crashed UFO. It was even pointed out that it bore a striking resemblance to the Star Wars Millennium Falcon, with its steel grey appearance. Others have claimed it could be the remains of a sunken city lost to the waves years ago. Now we have to admit that it does look like what we think of as a typical UFO. However, recently a group of divers collected samples from the mysterious entity and gave their findings to scientists, who determined that the Baltic Sea anomaly is simply a glacial deposit. Much of the Baltic Sea was carved out by moving glaciers during the Ice Age, many thousands of years ago and the object is just deposits left over from that process. However, members of the Ocean X team that first discovered the object still maintain that it's not a natural structure, claiming their electrical equipment stopped working when they got to within 200 meters of the anomaly. But when they moved 200 meters away from the object, it all turned on again, and when they repeated the process, the same thing happened. So for now, at least for the crew of Ocean X, the mystery still rumbles on. Heslington Brain In August of 2008, during the construction of the University of York's new campus, a darkened human skull was found face down in the mud. Alongside it were a small number of animal bone fragments, several former water channels, along with bronze and Iron Age artifacts. However, it was the human skull that fascinated scientists the most, as it appeared to still have its brain. Examination of the skull revealed fractures of the vertebrae at the base, and nine horizontal sharp force cut marks made by a thin bladed instrument on the frontal aspect of the centrum. The cut marks indicated that the head was carefully severed after the individual was hung. Additional examination of the skull revealed it contained a springy mass which was not consistent with the dark brown clay and silt the head was buried in. Further inspection revealed the presence of yellow material that was eventually identified to be the brain. The skull and brain were from a healthy male, estimated to be between 26 and 45 years of age, who died around 2,600 years ago. The mystery was how a human brain that had been buried for that length of time was still preserved. It was later concluded that its preservation was attributed to several factors. The waterlogged pit it was encased in contained anoxic soil, which deprived the ground of any oxygen, meaning decay did not occur. It was also thought the head was buried in the ground immediately after decapitation, leaving no time for decomposition to set in. Another factor is that in most cases with the process of body decay, bacteria swarm from the gut, which then spreads throughout the body via blood vessels. Because the head was severed and drained of blood, there was no opportunity for the bacteria to contaminate it. The brain was so well preserved that DNA sequencing was done that gave a close match to haplogroup J1D, which was first seen in individuals from Tuscany and the Near East, but had never been identified in Britain. Although much information about this individual has been revealed through archaeological and forensic studies, it remains a mystery why he was hung, beheaded, and very quickly just his head was buried face down in the ground. It wasn't unusual for ancient people to bury just a head, and it often indicated it was either a war trophy or a ceremonial sacrifice made for the appeasement of the gods. However, with the Heslington skull, the fact he was buried so quickly indicates that he was not killed in battle or deemed worthy for display. It's been suggested that historical accounts from both the Greeks and the Romans 
that the ancient people of Britain believed that natural bodies of water were doorways into other realms, and therefore needed human sacrifice in order to send their offerings to the gods. So was that the reason the Heslington skull was buried in such an unceremonious way? I guess we'll never know, unless modern science allows us to one day tap into the 2,600 year old preserved brain of the Heslington man, and can you just imagine how amazing that would be?